Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Murder Journal. I'm Mel. I'm with Tommy. Listen, we know we both look busted this morning. It is like butt crack early. We are both retired veterans. We don't have to wake up butt crack early no more, but we did. I, Tommy, I didn't even put my eyebrows on. Well, I did my hair. I took a shower so I could wake my ass up, but I'm still groggy. I got no makeup. I didn't. Even, I, I don't. I didn't even brush my teeth. Nope, I didn't either. I didn't. I didn't brush my hair until like literally just seconds right before you hit record. Yeah, I mean, all I had time to do was the morning business, if y'all know what I mean, <laughs> and adults, especially adults who are forty-five years old and above, y'all know what I mean. The morning business is a must. Leave us alone. Back in the day, we used to read a paper. Now we just put a speaker on and listen for when court's about to start. And then you just pinch it off. Is that what go. you did? That's what like. we did. So without further ado, <laughs> let's roll this intro. All right, Tommy, I'm ready. I am ready. We've got closing arguments today. And the good thing about that is they're only getting one hour each, period. No no coming back, nothing. One hour, then jury instructions. What I don't like, Tommy, is that with these jury, with the jury instructions, what's going to end up happening um, in this particular case is they're going to allow for a lesser charge. So even though the prosecution is is trying to present um, that she did this intentionally, if the jury thinks, well, she killed him, but it wasn't intentional, they're given the option for a lesser charge. Don't know. I know. I'm going to actually listen to jury instructions. I normally don't, but... I'm telling you right now, like, if if... They get an hour. Judge mm -hmm. says an hour. Cool. Jury deliberations comes back and they find her guilty, but give her a lesser charge. Nah, bro. It's the whole town in on it because <laughs> there's fucking <laughs> no way. No way. No, no way. way. I'm expecting a verdict today. I, so I am. am I. I think I'm expecting gonna, a not guilty verdict. I think the jury's going to literally go back there and do their vote. 20 minutes later, come back out. And we're going to have an answer. Yep, yep. Yep. I, I just see it that way because Same of everything here. that's been here, everything that I've watched and seen and talked about with you, mm -hmm. I, that's how I feel about it. It's going, it should be a quick deliberation. It if, really should. It really should. I, I, because there's this, it's comes down to it's not even a matter of whether or not she did it it's is there enough reasonable doubt to acquit her and there is so that will be very interesting to watch um because all they have to do when they get their jury packet is the foreman is well did she do the oh, the answer is no Psst, skip to question two no oh, Psst, skip to question three when it takes longer it's they're going through each one and seeing if it satisfies this well yeah but i just can't see that so I think it's, there's too much reasonable doubt. There's football fields, plural, of reasonable doubt. There's just so yeah. many holes that it's like, come on now. Um, Absolutely. Do you think the judge is going to read back over what the trial is on before they answer well, in all the, the beginning, questions? Yeah, in the beginning of the jury instructions, uh, the judge will reiterate the charges. Okay, okay. I just, I, I wondered that. Because mm -hmm. I know in the beginning they talk about it when they read everything. Uh, but I just didn't know if she was going to do it or not. I've sat in court before uh, where a jury and the judge didn't read the instructions to the jury when they went back. Yeah. But the, there's the, the judge is supposed to read jury instructions. And um, in the beginning of the jury instructions, before she gives them the charge, it... Um, that's when they reiterate the charges 
So I'm sorry if one of my headphones is disappearing. Look, again, we already said we were busted. Let's just get into closing. How about that? That's okay. My hair makes me disappear. Look, see, I lost an ear. I don't know. Yeah. Something well, about my hair today. It's all right. They're they they're not coming for us. So. <laughs> and yes, I haven't grown my hair out Look the since I joined the, before oh. the army. Oh, he started. The other way. He started off really good. Hold on. Look the other way. That's how Run he's it. starting. So this is a first for me in that defense is starting. Usually, with it's closing. Normally, it's prosecution. So this is this is interesting. And again, sometimes with closing, uh, whoever starts with closing, in this case, it's the defense. In most normal cases, it would be like defense then prosecution, but then the defense can come back up. In this particular case, the judge is like, nah, bro, you guys are getting an hour. Okay. What if he says this stuff in 20 minutes? Look the other way. He's angry. Look the other way. And it comes Four back words. after prosecution. He'll That's still have time. Well, this entire case. Four words that sum up the hopes of those who have tried to deceive you. <laughs> Conflicts of interest, doesn't matter. Just look the other way. Magic hairs, magic glass, look the other way. Late night calls and Google searches, falsified affidavits, inverted videos, and butt dials galore. <laughs> Just look the other way. <laughs> Love it. They want. That should be on a t-shirt. On, but the uncontrovertible fact is you have been lied to in this courtroom. Mm -hmm. And your job is to make sure you don't ever, ever look the other way. Your singular duty is, is to stare down the evidence and do it <clears throat> unflinchingly and do it unwaveringly. Holy shit. Do you know who that is? You see, you're the only thing standing. No, who is it? I can't That's see it there. Of injustice. It's Brian Albert. Is it? I've got the time clock and an arrow they blocking said, his face, so oh, I can't I really see I'm it. I'm sorry. So I got you guys, once we restart, look over here. From what I understand, the Alberts, to include Colin Albert and the McCabe's, are in court. I hope they arrest them right then and there. Uh, job you didn't ask for, <laughs> probably a job you didn't want. So you see, top right. There's Brian Albert. The Albert. greatest responsibility we have as citizens here in America. Lest the government stop answering to us and we start answering to the government. Mm. Mm. Low betide anyone, any one of us, any one of us who might find ourselves in the crosshairs of a Michael Proctor. Ooh. Today I was reminded of a quote. It's a quote about the truth. And I want to share it with you. It is of great importance to set a resolution never to tell an untruth. There is no vice so mean, so pitiful, so contemptible. And those who permit themselves to tell a lie once find it much easier to do it a second time and a third. This falsehood of the tongue leads to that of the heart. And in time, it depraves all its good dispositions. What does that mean? I have no clue. It means that it's been observed that to tell an untruth, to exaggerate, to make a false claim, it's a cancer. Mm -hmm. One lie begets another, and it's a malignancy that grows over time. And that, folks, is how a cover-up is born. That's how a Massachusetts state trooper says in whispered tones to his friends when he thought no one was looking or listening, how he would make a case how he would make it cut and dry, no matter the truth. How he would make sure to put, quote, serious charges on the girl. In other words, pin it on the girl. Mm -hmm. You may ask yourself, how does this happen? How could this happen? It's 2024. Surely people aren't going to come to this courtroom, this hall of justice, and lie to us. Just give us false information. Well, they did, and don't call me Shirley. Try to cover up the truth. The Alberts, the McCabe's, Higgins, Lang, Michael Proctor, Yuri Buchanan, Brian Tully. Oh, wonder if <laughs> they're all in court too. To support their narrative. You need only wonder how many times dropping bobs. Damn. And over and over, they and others were caught deceiving you. Big things, small things. It didn't really matter. I'm staring at Brian Albert. 
They'll look you in the eye and deny phone calls. They'll deny secret meetings. They'll claim that calls are butt dials and butt dials are answered. They'll show you a video and tell you left is right and right is left. Mm. They'll magically turn three pieces of plastic into five right before your eyes. And even when they're caught with their own lies, they won't blink. They don't sweat. They'll just look you, look you in the eye and demand, pay no attention. You folks look the other way. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a cover-up in this case, plain and simple. Yep. You'll surely say to yourself, I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe that can happen in our community. But sadly, over the past eight weeks, you've seen it right before your eyes. So how does a cover-up happen? How could that happen? Well, let's count the ways, shall we? Let's mm -hmm. count them. Hand pick your investigator. Make sure it's someone we know, someone on our side. Keep them close. Offer them help. Offer them a gift. That's usually a guilty person. That's how most people get caught. Your call history. Make mysterious phone calls at 2.22 a.m. Delete Google searches. Monitor police activity. Get rid of evidence. Get rid Wash of your clothes. Call. Destroy your phones. Destroy your SIM card. Mm. For the investigator, decide on a narrative early on. Don't go to the crime scene. Don't take witnesses in for questioning. Witness, question all the witnesses together. Ignore witnesses who don't fit your narrative. Allow for the, the, the logs. Oh, why did he jump? Don't create any logs I don't whatsoever. He, I think don't he... maintain a chain of custody. Keep all the evidence in the hands of one person. Want me person. to go back? Yeah, I don't know. Why did it jump? That was good. Monitor police activity. Get rid of evidence. Get rid of your dog. Destroy your phones. Destroy your SIM card. Look at Brian Albert. For the investigator, decide on a narrative early on. Don't go to the crime scene. Don't take witnesses in for questioning. Witness, question all the witnesses together. Ignore witnesses who don't fit your narrative. Allow for the, the, the logs. Don't create oh. any logs whatsoever. Which in the matrix. In the Someone didn't all want that being shown. Person, and then manipulate that evidence for filming videos. <laughs> Don't turn over videos, invert videos, turn 416 PM into 530 PM in affidavits, mm. turn three pieces of taillight into five pieces of taillight, delete 42 minutes of surveillance footage, hide personal relationships, make this case cut and dry and ensure the homeowner quote, never sees any shit because he's a Boston cop. But most importantly, Pick your patsy and pin it on the girl. Mm -hmm. It's not that it could happen. It's that it every did. single one of those things I just mentioned did happen right in front of you. But this sort of injustice can't happen in a vacuum. So what about the prosecution? What about the Commonwealth? What does it look like when the government picks a narrative and then tries to form a prosecution around the narrative? instead of the other way around. Looks a lot like this. If you don't have actual evidence, just throw every th single thing you can against the wall to see what sticks. Drag her through the mud and make sure you attack her character. And that's what you saw in this case. The Commonwealth spent uh, much of their time and resources trying to vilify Karen Reed. They desperately resorted to calling witnesses to talk about Karen Reed and John, uh, John O'Keefe's arguments. They even stooped so low as to call the children and put them through this ordeal. All to say that John sometimes got upset because Karen was too kind, too nice, spoiled them too much. Their arguments <laughs> illustrated what anybody could imagine is a normal set of ups and downs for any couple. I would love that. You know what I'm saying? Spoil my children. Out, they communicated, they worked out their issues, and they had a nice, affectionate evening, evening out with their friends. And you don't have to take my word for it. Pull the tape, as they say. Look at the videos. C.F. McCarthy. Waterfall. What are the words that every single person who testified in this case used about Karen Reed and John O'Keefe that night? Getting along. No issues. Good mood. Happy. Affectionate. Even lovey-dovey. No issues, no toxicity. They were a loving couple right up into the time Karen Reed dropped him off and he walked into 34 Fairview. If an argument with a loved one is a motive for murder, folks, we're all in trouble. 
Speaking of which, what is the evidence that John went into the house? The Commonwealth will tell you, undoubtedly, no, he never went in the house. And they'll point to certain witnesses who they say didn't see him go in. Well, the question you have to ask yourself is, can you rely on that? First, there are, these are all people who are related to or committed to the Alberts in some way or another. That all-powerful Canton family, it's easy to say, I didn't see something, because how can that really be challenged? Right. Some, our second, some actually may not have seen John walk into the house. They were in the kitchen, as you recall, from uh, Nicole. Third, at least one witness, Brian Higgins, forgot his narrative, at least for a second, and he admitted a man did, in fact, come into the house. And when he was caught and asked to describe that man, he had to. It was a little bit vague. But you remember what he said. He was tall with dark hair. That was a telling slip of the tongue by Brian Higgins. Yeah. What's the real evidence of the unbiased data, the data that's not connected to the Albert family? How about John's Apple Health data? It shows that at 12.21 a.m., an important time, John arrived. That's established by, mon by the monotonic time clock you heard about in this trial. It was on his phone, and that represents a huge problem for the Commonwealth. It shows that he took 80 steps and ascended or descended three flights of stairs at that time. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It matches. Walks into the house, goes directly to the basement. There's your 80 steps and you're descending flights of stairs. The big problem for the Commonwealth is he wasn't outside at the car ascending and descending stairs, wasn't climbing on top of the car. So they'll tell you, wait, 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 don't look at the, the Apple Health data, look at this other thing called Waze. But Rick Green explained that if you apply the three minute offset that is built into that monotonic time, it aligns perfectly. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to see that, they don't want you to pay attention. They want you to look the other way. But even more importantly, at approximately 12.32 a.m., someone holding John's phone takes another 36 steps and travels 25 meters. Why is that so important? Because by 12.32 a.m., Karen Reed was gone. She had already left the location. She left at 12.30. Wow. Clipper Garino told you that Karen Reed's phone connected to John's Wi-Fi at what time? 1236. It is undisputed in this case that it's a six-minute drive on a good day from 34 Fairview over to One Meadows. She was gone by 1230, and John's phone was taking 36 steps and logging 25 meters at 1232 after she left time travel don't be fooled John time travel into that house after which karen drove away and the scientific data all prove it love that word I that was too. perfect ryan nagel and heather maxson prove it in addition to the apple health data ryan and heather both independently testified that they passed karen's suv as they drove away after talking to julie and karen was alone in the suv john was not with her he wasn't mm -hmm. in the car. He wasn't standing outside the car. He wasn't sitting beside the car. He wasn't laying on the ground beside the car. He was nowhere in sight. There's only one other place that John could have been, and that's in the house. Mm. Exactly where the Apple Health data places him. Hmm. So it all fits. And Ryan was right behind her, remember, staring at her taillights, undamaged, brightly lit. That brings up another difficulty for the Commonwealth, and that's their star witness, Jennifer McCabe. You'll recall that Jennifer McCabe claimed that she was looking out the door, staring at that SUV over and over and over again, uh -huh. 1229 to 1250. She was very Impossible. about that time frame. But we know that the SUV was gone from 34th Fairview by about 1230. She would have seen the accident. You know what I'm saying? And if right. she was staring out for 20 minutes out that window, that door, Mm -hmm. she would have seen the accident but he you know what i'm i this is why i love closing arguments because now we're seeing this timeline right off the bat of it and it's making it a lot easier for me karen reed was gone yeah. and it's undisputed their own investigators acknowledged that so it couldn't have happened 
just based off of their own testimony. This is brilliant. This I bet you he wrote good essays. He connected the Wi-Fi at 1236. So unequivocally, Jennifer McCabe was lying about watching that SUV, and it makes you wonder why. Mm -hmm. And to add to that deceit, she was also blatantly lying about the calls to John's phone. You remember that colloquy back and forth. Mm -hmm. She said that every single one of those calls to John's phone during that time was a butt dial. <laughs> How are those lies connected? <laughs> and why are they connected? Jennifer McCabe knows. Was she butt dialing John over and over? I think she's protecting her. John's phone that went missing. She's protecting somebody. And that's all I, I'm going to say about that. I think the reason why she was calling the phone over and over and over is exactly to, what he literally to just To find said. where the phone is to, to get it out of the house. where the phone is. Yeah. Let me get back. I Like I said, I have theory, but this isn't about a theory. This is about trial right now. Mm -hmm. I just okay. Let's play this really quick. Phone that went missing. Oopsie, not far enough. Give me a second. How are those lies connected, <coughs> and why are they connected? Jennifer McCabe knows. Was she butt dialing John over and over, or was someone looking for John's phone that went missing? Brilliant. Dun, Let's dun, talk for a second dun. about what actually happened in the time leading up to everyone going to 34 Fairview. Brian Albert, Brian Higgins show up drunk at the waterfall. They've been drinking in the afternoon. You know about the flirtatious texts mm -hmm. uh, that were sent mm -hmm. between Karen Reed and Brian. Mm -hmm. Higgins was clearly pining over Karen, but for her, the flirtation had ran its course. It was done. She was happy and committed to John. You could see that in her actions with John that night. You don't have to guess. Brian Higgins, however, you can see in his actions, he wasn't quite so satisfied and he wasn't done. His text message, um, well, meaning, what the hell, Karen? That's because he had no game whatsoever. He had no game. Seemed annoyed. He didn't like being ignored. That was pretty clear. So he's five or six whiskeys deep into the night by this time, <laughs> and she continued to ignore him. Then oddly... Higgins, who doesn't know John all that well, seems to want to coax John to 34 Fairview. Hmm. I'll draw your attention to the waterfall tape if, you're, if you want to take another look at it. It's at 11, the 1157 mark, between 1157 and 1158. Take a look at that tape. He's just about to leave. Higgins is just about to leave. He points over at John and he motions for him. Come on. Come on. Come with me. And then at 1220, he texts him, you coming here? This is a person he doesn't really know and didn't really talk to that entire night. Ask yourself, why was Higgins so insistent that John go to 34 Fairview that night? Mm. Look at Albert, sparring and fighting Brian Albert. That he and Brian Albert were engaged in. Of all the things they could be doing, this is what they were doing just minutes before John O'Keefe walked into that house at 34 Fairview. We know that once once John actually did walk in the door, it's about two steps, four feet or so, two steps for, a, for an adult male to reach that basement door. Remember, everybody was gathered in the kitchen, what Nicole Albert said, and every single witness agreed that at some point, Brian Higgins and Brian Albert left the group and went to another room. Where did they go? Where did they go together? Another important point, Chloe, was not upstairs. Brian Albert slipped in one of his testa in, in testimony that he provided. Yeah, you see Albert's mouth. Chloe downstairs monitoring her because of the other people in the house. She's not good with strangers. Remember that testimony. So what happened next? We absolutely know that John was in the house. The data, Ryan, Heather, they all established that. We know that John ascended or descended stairs. We know that Brian Higgins and Brian Albert excused themselves. How long does it take? How long you mean? To have a crossword. How long does it take to have a fight? How long would it? Just so you know, Tommy, <clears throat> at least six times over the last like two weeks, instead of saying how long, I have literally said how long. Thanks, Jen McCabe. 
what it takes for Brian Higgins to say to John, you know, your girl's been texting me. A push, a punch, a fall, pull Chloe off his arm, and now it's done. What was that? Five seconds? Ten? Doesn't take long at all. And then the panic sets in. It wasn't intended to go that far, but what's done is done. And then some very, very odd things start happening at the Albert household. Very odd indeed. What do we know? We know through the testimony and key swipes that Brian Higgins very oddly goes directly to Canton Police Department. Why would he do that? After a night of drinking and partying, why go to CPD when you're drunk? What was so important there? He couldn't even get his own story straight. First, he said it was administrative work. Then he said he was moving cars. Then he said it was a, a, a factor of both. Is it both? Was it neither? Or was, it th was he there to gather intel? Ask yourself, why go? But the odd things keep piling up. And here's another. Chloe was the Albert family pet. Not only did she appear to be gone from the house that morning on January 29th, nobody saw her there. Even Jim McCabe admitted, yeah, I didn't see her there. <coughs> but they actually got rid of the dog altogether. Mm -hmm. In months of this incident, the dog was gone, out of the house, rehomed, never to be seen again. This was a dog they had had for seven years. Right. Also a dog who had a bite history. Why was it so important to get rid of that dog? Was there something about the dog they did not want law enforcement to find out? Yeah. Did it Recall what Dr. Russell attack said. Attack John O'Keefe. To a thousand animal attacks. In her expert opinion, John's right arm, those injuries are from an animal, quote, most likely a large dog. And Dr. Russell's I testimony, think. I'll remind you, was undisputed by any witness. Hey, pause it real quick. But there so I'm not going to go all the way into the theory, but if he was down in that weight room, I think John was struck from behind uh, and then, you know, caught off balance. And I do think that it wasn't just Higgins who beat him. Oh, no. I, the Chloe yeah. attacked. But I think the, the biggest thing was the hit from behind was the finishing move. I, See, they I didn't don't... confirm how he died. Well, they, just, yeah, they couldn't. It's undetermined. Yeah. But I'm just thinking, like, I mean, he could have fell back and hit his head. And right. that's, See, how he that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking if he went down in the basement, if uh, he got in a fight with uh, Colin Albert, because I'm thinking of the knuckles, the from yeah, the that's photos. Who I'm thinking. I'm just, yeah, I'm not I'm not, sub you know, people were not just pulling this from our bed. I'm just going based off of what's been presented by the prosecution here. Um, looking at Colin Albert's knuckles and Brian Higgins and the way everything happened. I think that a fight ensued and then Chloe got involved as she attacked John um, or jumped on him and bit him. He fell back, hit his head, died. They're like, oh shit, what do we do? And, you know, he was never so, here. He was never want, here. You've, you've been in fights before. Where's the first punch ever thrown? It's usually to the face. To the back. face. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if if Colin didn't steal him means he punched him when him and Higgins or John O'Keefe and Higgins were talking or arguing back and forth. That caught him off guard and he was the actual person who struck him and it fell down. I, I don't there's, know. There's a lot of yeah, speculation. There's so much speculation. But, but the fact that we are speculating now based off of the prosecution's case it it case in chief it goes to reasonable doubt Let's yeah that's what i'm saying it oh, just leads so to too weird. much reasonable doubt mm -hmm. and that's what i was getting at the whole the whole spiel reasonable doubt after a night of drinking and hanging out and partying after being together for the entire day at 2 22 a.m brian albert decides to call brian higgins that call was missed but 17 seconds later higgins calls brian back and they speak for 22 seconds. Now that call is odd and suspicious enough and just in and of itself, the fact that the call was made. But what's even more incriminating is that both men 
both of them lied about the calls happening. Mm -hmm. They both claim astonishingly that those calls are butt dials. Say it with me. Butt, <laughs> butt dials. He said, Amazing. say it with me. <laughs> but Albert and Higgins take Jenna McKay, butt dialed. Not only did they oh, that was all right. Now, Albert, oh, butt dial. Was... Higgins, oh. butt dialed. <laughs> They all of, but, uh, hey, I'm going to take uh, another statement he said earlier about Jenna McCabe and that whole Jen. Butt dial whatever. Well, because Jenna I, McCabe is actually somebody different. Jen McCabe. Yeah. I don't give a crap anymore, but <laughs> I want to take that. He, uh, I'm going to have to go back, but it was something about butt dial. Mm -hmm. I think that should be another t shirt. Oh, yeah. Oops, I butt dialed you, and then hey, the rest of his saying is on the back. Both <laughs> men, both of them, lied about the calls happening. They both claim astonishingly that those calls are, you probably say it with me, they're butt dials. Amazing. But Albert and Higgins take it a step further. Not only did they claim that they were making calls as butt dials, but they were answering calls as butt dials. And Higgins seemed awfully defensive about that call, didn't he? Remember on cross-examination when I was asking him, can you have a conversation in 22 seconds? Look and quickly said, Hannah. no, that's impossible. It's not reasonable. You can't She's do it. She's listening. She is Let's listening. Let's test that out. Mm -hmm. Hey, did you make it over to Canton? Yep. Haven't been any calls. Nobody knows a thing. All right, don't talk to anybody until, until we talk again. Okay, fine. And by the way, Come back over. I need help moving something heavy. How long did that take? 15 seconds, maybe? But the odd behavior isn't done yet. Five minutes after that call that we just talked about, Jennifer McCabe is on her phone at her house, Google searching how long it takes for someone to die in the cold. That was at 2.27 a.m. That timeline seems to fit, doesn't it? And it fits a very telling and a very clear story. That search became a focal, uh, a focal point of the Commonwealth's entire case. This case was starting to look a lot more like the defense of Jennifer McCabe than anything else. Yes, I'm glad and he said that. Because there is no innocent explanation for that Google search at 2.27 mm -hmm. a.m. None. At the end of the day, clearing away all the confusion the Commonwealth, of the Commonwealth's experts, we're left with two things that are true. First, neither of their experts could absolutely rule out that Jennifer, Jennifer McCabe made that search at 2.27 a.m. Neither. And second, the only person to use the actual phone model, the actual data, and the actual precise operating system was Rick Green. And he was clear. That search was at or before 2.27 a.m. And then it was deleted. Mm, so it did happen. So what else was going on at or around this same time when all this suspicious activity was happening at the Albert House and the McCabe House? Three minutes after that search and eight minutes after the Albert Higgins 2.22 a.m. call, Brian Lochran drives down the street in his snowplow. Good old lucky. And he told you that That was loud. Sorry, no people. Body laying on the lawn you're like suck starting your mic right now in the morning <laughs> getting all up in there yelling he didn't just simply say he didn't see a body he wasn't paying attention he said there was no body there he knows the property he knows the owners he's grown up with these folks he passes by all the time not once not twice three passes there was nobody on that lawn and three period, passes at 2 30 a.m and what other suspicious thing happened that night by 3.30 a.m., someone moved a Ford Edge in front of the very area that would obstruct the view of where John's body would ultimately be discovered. Mm -hmm. Who's the only person in this case that you've heard about with the Ford Edge? Brian Albert. Remember, as you're thinking about this, the basement at 34 Fairview is serviced by a bulkhead. It's a quick and convenient door to the backyard. And that backyard is serviced by a side fence. And that side fence is easily accessible to the front yard at the side of the house. Which side of the house? The side where John's body was found. So the whole time, I thought the Ford 
edge belonged to Colin Albert, but apparently I'm wrong. It was Brian Albert's vehicle that Colin Albert has been seen driving. Interesting. And by 6 a.m., John's body was, in fact, now outside. While this flurry of suspicious activity was going on with the Alberts and the McCabe's, what's happening with Karen? All she knows at this point, think about it, at approximately 221, she dropped off John. He walked into 34 Fairview, and that's all she knows. She knows nothing else that was going on. So what was she left to think? She goes in to check, uh, he goes in to check the party out, but all of a sudden he's not coming back. He's not responding. Minutes start to pass. One minute turns to two, two turn to 10. Where is he? Why isn't he responding? She's sitting in the cold, dark, freezing outside in the car. Naturally, she's perturbed. Being perturbed turns into being peeved. And being peeved eventually turns into being pissed. By 12.30, Karen's mad. She's left 34 Fairview to make a point, but she's still <laughs> texting and calling. What, she, what could she reasonably be thinking at this point? What's going through her mind? 12.33 turns into 12.34. I can't believe he'd do this to me. 1234 turns into 1235. Where is he? Why aren't you answering, John? 1235 turns to 1236. Jesus Christ. I'm calling and you're not answering. Where are you? Pick up the phone. But there's still no answer. So on behalf of women, I got to let y'all know. This behavior by Karen Reed. If. Come on, ladies, you know damn well. It's it's that's not like striking uh behavior and reaction when things are already rocky. Um trying to work on your relationship. You just left him at a bar and he's now, or you just, you know, you guys were at a bar and now he's going to an after party. You're not going to the after party. Um instead of coming home with you. He's going to stay at the party and you're going to watch the kids. Every woman's going to be calling their man. And if he don't answer that fucking phone, pardon my language, done, son. And then the every time a text doesn't get answered, you feel that anger rise. And then he don't answer. And you know when it's going straight to voicemail. Come on, ladies, you know damn well you would behave and you would have reacted like Karen would in terms of the texts and the phone calls and the voicemails. So it's well, not can, that big of a deal to me. I could imagine like someone not answering the phone. You would think that they're probably messing around. Mm -hmm. Well, after a while, but if they're already arguing and she's yeah. hot headed, she's just getting mad. She wants him home with her. So she's getting mad. You I can see it, that too. You know what it does tell me though? Speak. She's not with him. She wasn't there. She doesn't know. And she's genuinely getting mad. That's a yeah. normal female response, man. The moral of the story is y'all need to answer your fucking phones. There's still no response. <laughs> By 1237, she's getting furious. She does not know that something has happened to John. She does not know that. So she leaves the first angry voicemail. Illustrates frustration, aggravation, all the normal responses anybody might have right you and i, I might said that but little did she know the next open voicemail has karen parking at john's garage after she gets home you can hear her heels clicking across the garage floor mm -hmm. for all no she for all she knows at this point john's just drunk he's been partying he's hanging out just forgot about her blowing her off but john's still not responding and as the minutes tick by karen becomes increasingly <laughs> increasingly upset those are the voicemails that you heard how could he do this? Why is he ignoring me? Why is he ignoring the kids? Those are the thoughts bearing down on Karen Reed as she sat in an empty house late at night by herself. Ladies and gentlemen, she did not know what had happened to John. This whole trial, she's had spell, duck lips. You quickly learn what she was thinking, and what she was feeling. Now it's five. I think that's just her natural look. She's woken but up I get what you're saying. He hasn't come home and he hasn't responded to a single text not a single call, and anger quickly turns to panic and abject fear. She's so distraught, she reaches out to him again. John, where the fuck are you? She, sh she says through tears and desperation. 
And at 6.03, the question was answered and her worst fears were realized when she finds his body laying, dying in the cold in Brian Albert's front yard. She just took a you deep breath. Her. You can feel the grief. You can feel the raw anguish. You can see it. You don't have to wonder the emotional journey that Karen traveled that night. I know she's during trial, but she still looks sorry for John. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like Mrs. From the time he left her and walked into 34 Fairview and she called, she reached out 53 times. She called him 50 53 times. Oh, man. Think about that. The Commonwealth wants you to believe that she murdered this man. And then after that murder, she called him not once, not twice, 53 times. Doesn't make sense. It makes no sense. What does make sense is that she emotionally moved from anger, then to panic, then to grief. So back at 5.07, when she began her search looking for John, she backed out of the garage, and what would happen next would change the entire course of this case. As she backed out of that garage, she hit John's traverse and cracked her right rear taillight. Folks, the Commonwealth has one job to do in this courtroom. <laughs> it's an immutable responsibility to provide you with the truth. That's it. Mm -hmm. Not to win the case, but to seek justice and to do it through the truth. Ask yourself, did you get that truth from the Commonwealth? The Commonwealth continually tried to tell you that that video showed that the SUV came close to John's traverse, and it took us showing you the video to unequivocally establish that Karen hit that car and cracked her taillight at 5.07. You can almost hear an audible gasp in the courtroom when we finally showed you the actual video. We can mm -hmm. see that tire move. I'm only going to show you one series of exhibits during my entire closing, but it's that important. <clears throat> And it's this, look at the condition of her taillight when she pulls out of the driveway at 5.07. Exactly. That taillight, and I'm going to choose my words very carefully here. It's intact. That taillight is cracked, but it's not completely damaged. And if right. there was any question in your mind about the level of damage to that taillight at 5.07, all there of that it is. was extinguished. When Dighton police officer Barrows walked into this courtroom, He's a sworn officer. He's not associated with Canton. He's not associated with the Alberts. He's not associated with the McCabe's. He doesn't know Michael Proctor. In other words, he doesn't answer to any of these folks. He's an outsider and he's completely independent. And his words were the following, quote, that taillight was not completely damaged. It was cracked. A piece was missing, but not completely damaged. Take a look at this photograph and tell me. Which one looks like Officer Barros's description? The one on the left or the one on the right? The reconstructed yeah. light on the left is what that light looked like before it was in Trooper Proctor's possession. Remember that. That's mm. what it looked like before Trooper Proctor had access to the SUV. And you have an independent police officer telling you so. Mm -hmm. You'll recall that after John's body was discovered, blank, very good friend of the Alberts walked into Brian Albert's house and had an off the record meeting with him. No one's <laughs> ever going to know exactly what that meeting was about, what they discussed, because that interview, like everything else in this case, it wasn't recorded. It wasn't memorialized. But we do know that shortly thereafter, the Canton Police Department was recused from the matter entirely. And the case was assigned to one Michael Proctor. Hmm. You have to believe that when the Alberts found that out, they thought they hit the lottery. They thought they hit the lottery. What are the chances? The department where my brother works, that would have been great to investigate this case, but that, that department's been recused. That's tough luck. But the guy who catches the case is Michael Proctor, a guy we go back with for decades. At such a break, they probably thought, when this is over, we need to get that dude a gift. Oh, oh wait a minute. They didn't think that. They said it out loud. They did. <laughs> they said it. But still, you've got to imagine that the Alberts had to be stressed. I love his sarcasm. The whole thing about a dead body being on their lawn. <laughs> get some attention. And they had to be wondering, will he set up the crime scene? Hold on. Did you catch that? Yes. That is amazeballs. Hold on. If you don't appreciate this sarcasm, I, I, I got nothing for you. 
Okay, he's hysterical. What with that whole thing about a dead body being on their lawn? <laughs> that might get some attention. And they had to be wondering, will he set up a crime scene? Is he going to come into the house? Is he going to search the house? Is he going to send in a forensics, uh, a forensics team? Is he going to interview witnesses? Is he going to take us to the station? I shouldn't have. Will I shouldn't be laughing. Phones? Will he look at our communications? Will he look at our Google searches? Will he look at our early morning phone calls? Is he going to look in the basement? Mm. And Michael Proctor answered every single one of those questions resoundingly. Nope. That's exactly what he to. <laughs> and with that, Michael Proctor didn't draw a thin blue line. He erected a tall blue wall. Brilliant. A wall that you can't see. Brilliant. A wall that Karen Reed certainly couldn't get over. A wall between us and them. A place you folks are not invited. We protect our own. It's us or it's them. And by the way, who's she after all? Just Nobody. an outsider. An outsider. This is going to be easy. And he called her all sorts of names. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, and telling his high school buddies about nudes and nope. Like, mm -hmm. come on, man. That's. Here I'm amazed go. he's still a trooper. Like, that and should he, be unbecoming and gone. What Michael Proctor actually did and did not do in this case. One of the consistent issues that's come up throughout this trial is how evidence always seems to be changing and evolving when in Michael Proctor's hands or somebody in his orbit. If it happens once, let's chalk it up to a mistake. Twice, it's starting to look a little bit like incompetence. If that happens every single time, it becomes intentional, mm -hmm. which means it becomes corruption. Mm -hmm. Hey, pause it real quick. Do you think Brian time. Albert's in the courtroom just to show face so the jury can see him? Because he It's might not just him. It's but all saying, of the Alberts and McCabe's. They're all there. I I don't know why you'd even be there. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. uh, but nothing they've done made sense. I don't know. Maybe they're trying to show, uh, present a show of force and, you know, yeah. or something. I don't know. I'll, if I were them, I would move out of Canton. Time, we spent some time. Move to Florida or something. Time that Michael Proctor swore to in affidavits. There was a reason that we believed it was so important. A reason. <laughs> because this was a concerted effort by Michael Proctor to falsify the time the car was seized so that mm. no one would know that he actually had possession of the car before the first pieces of taillight were ever discovered at the scene. But he got caught. Mm -hmm. And when he did, the best he could come up with was it was a typo. Like a dozen times a typo. <laughs> a dozen you times. I remember what that testimony was. The truth is that car was in Michael Proctor's possession from about 12, sorry, 412 in the afternoon. He said it was 416 when he finally had to tell the truth or some version of the truth. Those first pieces of taillight were not found until after 5.45 p.m. That is the very fact that Michael Proctor was trying to hide by those falsified affidavits, saying he didn't seize the car until 5.30. But that wasn't Michael Proctor's only manipulation of the investigation. What about Brian Lockrey? You met him. Lucky. Michael Proctor did his level best to not just hide evidence, but to hide human beings from you and from us. Uh, video evidence the <laughs> uh, of, of her pulling into the driveway at the exact times in question. Even Michael Trotta expressly told Michael Proctor that 34 Fairview had in fact been plowed that morning and by whom. Proctor not only did not interview Brian Lochran, he never disclosed his name in a single report. He <laughs> hit him. This is a witness who was literally on 34 Fairview at the time in question where a body was found on the lawn. Wouldn't you want to get the, the truth from an eyewitness? Wouldn't you want to seek that out? Mm -hmm. Not if you're Michael Proctor, a close friend of the Alberts. If it were up to Proctor, you literally never would have heard of or from Brian Lockhart. That's a scary prospect. Yep.
I want to touch briefly on the additional physical evidence or some additional physical evidence presented by the Commonwealth in this case. You'll recall Christina <laughs> Hanley. She established to a scientific certainty that the glass on the bumper, which was told to you in opening statement, was going to have something to do with this case. The glass on the bumper was going to match that cocktail glass. <laughs> she told you unequivocally the glass no, on no. the bumper did not match the cocktail glass. They came from two different sources. The mm -hmm. glass on the bumper has nothing to do with the cocktail glass. So that glass on the bumper had to get there somehow. It didn't get and there by being broken from the glass. It didn't get there traveling miles. It on the bumper somehow. It didn't jump up there by itself. And on ramp and off ramp really of the truck. Like, come on now. There was one piece on the bumper, one, only one, that matched something else in the case. It was a perfect match to a piece of glass that was supposedly found at the scene. Who do you think had possession of that matching glass? Michael Proctor. So the glass on the bumper had to be placed there. And the only person who had anything close to matching the part, the, the pieces that had to be placed there is Michael Proctor. Fucking you planning know. evidence. You know what I'm saying? Like, gotcha, coach. Hair. The Commonwealth spent a lot of time bringing in experts about mitochondrial DNA and maternal, D, uh, maternal DNA lines and comparative analyses, and all that sounds really great and really sciencey, except for the fact that it just doesn't matter. Why? Because you would have to believe that that little hair, tiny, tiny little hair, barely perched on the side of that SUV through nearly, uh, survived nearly 75 miles of yeah. a raging blizzard outside. That would be a magic hair indeed. That magic hair means nothing. The DNA means nothing. And that's because the hair was from somewhere else. It certainly was not from a motor vehicle incident at 34 Fairview on January 29th. That hair was placed there. The DNA on the outside of the taillight housing also merits very little discussion. John's DNA would be expected to be found all over that SUV, inside, outside, the exterior, uh -huh. the interior. Everything he touched would have had his DNA on it. Here's what the actual, here's what's actually important about that DNA. No DNA was found on the interior of that taillight. The taillight that they now claim crashed into his arm and shattered. No blood was found anywhere on that taillight or any taillight pieces. No <laughs> yeah. tissue was found anywhere on that taillight or any ta taillight pieces. Yep. But we're to believe that that taillight really exploded on John's arm at 25 miles an hour with a thousand pounds of pressure. 24. I got corrected eight Talk times yesterday. Evidence doing very funny things when in Proctor's possession or the possession of somebody in his orbit. Now think about the videos that you saw. How many videos appear to be somehow manipulated or altered? Just about every single one of them. Mm -hmm. Look at the video of the Sally port. Let's take that one, for example, that grainy one. It's missing the exact time that would show the condition of the taillight when it was pulled in to the Sally port. Pretty important time, wouldn't you think? Yeah, it's deleted by Proctor. What the condition of the taillight was at that exact time. He admitted to... There's a second video. It's much clearer. And it's from the same time frame. We didn't get that one for about two and a half years into the investigation. Literally, <laughs> after the trial started. But that one was turned over. And this is important. The Commonwealth introduced you to a person by the name of Yuri Buchanan. They presented video showing what was clearly the right side of the car. Mm -hmm. They asked questions about the right side of the car. You'll recall, Mr. Lally asked Sergeant Buchanan, did you or Trooper Proctor ever go at, to, at, or near the right side of that taillight? And while he was asking the question, what appeared to be the right side of the car was looking at you. The video was still up. Buchanan paused, turned earnestly into the microphone, stared at you and said, never. We never went anywhere around that taillight while he was showing you the right side of the car. And that trick might have worked until we got up to cross-examine him. And only then, on the second day of his testimony, did he have to admit that the video was actually inverted. It was backward. And it was cleverly inverted at that. The timestamp had the proper orientation, which means that timestamp had to be removed, the video inverted, and the timestamp placed back on it which means that was done intentionally. That was not a mistake. Mm -hmm. And when caught yep, doctored. 
fabrication, mm -hmm. Buchanan doubled down and said, it's exactly the same. You remember that back and forth. It's exactly the same, he said, as if we're stupid. Is it exactly the same or is it exactly opposite? Ladies and gentlemen, you were lied to. There is no other way to say it. It's inexcusable. It's abhorrent. But it's also a paradigm of everything that the, the investigators have been willing to do in this case. Lie, obfuscate, manipulate, alter. And when they're caught, they just excuse it away. Doesn't matter. It's the same thing. What's the big deal? Just look the other way. And don't forget, Buchanan is Proctor's supervisor. And he was in that little group chat where Karen, Karen Reed's naked photos were being searched for. See, told you. Talking about the apple falling from the tree. They Looking for naked you. pictures. Mm -hmm. the taillight yet. You'll recall that at the very beginning of this case, you were introduced to no fewer than five CPD officers. Very early on, who searched the scene. None of them, not a single one, found any taillight material at the scene. Zero. Mm -hmm. Zero. Stephen Seraf, Sean Good, Stephen Mulaney. Michael Why does the dog keep popping up? I don't know. I'm. I, I don't know. Right around there, they were all looking. They were searching with their their eyes. They were searching with their hands. Some said they were searching with their feet. They even used tools, a leaf blower. Not one piece of bright red taillight material was at the scene. Not a single piece. But incredibly, over the course of the next three weeks, according to Michael Proctor, forty-seven pieces of taillight material would end up being found. Some of which forty-seven of a salad plate. <laughs> a salad a plate shows up later <laughs> on January 29th, and according to O'Hara, the first few pieces of daylight were found about 5:45. And here's some interesting testimony that you heard. Who else was there? Who did O'Hara say was there? Well, he said his team was there. We certainly expected that, but then he said there were others. These other mysterious figures, some from Canton PD some from the Massachusetts State Police that he could not account for. Heavy coats, big masks, hats. Mm -hmm. Even Lieutenant O'Hara could not tell who was who. But he mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they wore boggins and everything to cover up their facial features. Like, But you could tell by body size who it was. Like, come on now. I can tell who I am, even if I'm completely covered. You know who you are. <laughs> you know you there unaccounted for. And during that search that was overseen by they had a bunch of bank robbers looking over the car. <laughs> material were found. That's super important, and I want to concentrate on that for a second. O'Hara said all three pieces were in an area about 12 inches, 12 inches square. That's an area about as big as your dinner plate. Tully, however, claimed that one red piece was found about three feet away from that was a shoe about one and a half, sorry, one to two feet from that was a clear piece of plastic. And a few feet away from that was a red piece of plastic. So we have red. Next to the fire hydrant. Red. Mm -hmm. the, the span of about, you added up probably 10 or 12 feet. Ladies and gentlemen, both of those things cannot be true. Somebody is taking liberties with the facts. Uh -huh. Tim Lieutenant Tully comes to court and makes this big grand gesture of opening all these evidence bags. These two evidence bags in particular, represent exactly what we're talking about. Those three pieces, red, mm -hmm. clear, red. They're marked, they're sealed, they, they look official. They're not stop and shop bags, thank God. At least they've moved up from that. <laughs> oh, no. Brown paper bag, <laughs> evidence with blood in it. Six, <laughs> six solo cups of blood and snow. AJ, stop it. In a shop right brown bag. I mean, <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> AJ, the sarcasm is strong in this one. I mean, he even yeah, pulled right. out punches during the trial. He, I know, like, but now you, he's unre you now suck. he's like <laughs> he's been chomping at the bed. Look at his eyes right now. It <laughs> just looks <laughs> angry. <laughs> <laughs> Clear and red over the, the span of about added up probably 10 or 12 feet. Ladies and gentlemen, both of those things cannot be true. Somebody is taking liberties with the facts. Plan and evidence. Until he comes to court and makes this big grand gesture of opening all these evidence bags. Mm -hmm. These two evidence bags in particular represent exactly what we're talking about. Those three pieces, red, clear, red. 
They're marked. They're sealed. They, they look official. They're not stop and shop bags, thank God. At least they've moved up from that. <laughs> they've even got evidence tape on them. Who knew? It's evidence tape around here. <laughs> so this must be real evidence, right? It must be real evidence in this case. And after making that big theatrical display, he opens up the bag with the red pieces and he pulls two pieces out. That's okay. Put the red, two red pieces together. Good so far. Then he opens up the second bag under Mr. Lally's questioning. And you remember he hesitated just a second. Opened that bag and pulled out one piece of clear plastic. Then pulled out a second piece of clear plastic with no explanation as to how that could have possibly happened. And he quickly returned all four of those back into the bag, sealed them up, and we're done for the day. The next day, I asked about that evidence again. <laughs> I asked him to open up that bag with the red pieces, and he did the same thing. He pulled out two red pieces of plastic. I said, you'll recall this, I said, look deeper. Look closer, sir. Pull everything out of that bag. Would he have had I not suggested it? Nope. And then he pulled a third piece of red plastic out of the bag. So miraculously, Trooper Tully's three pieces of plastic became five pieces of plastic <clears throat> right before your eyes. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, the forces at play that multiply those pieces of plastic inside those evidence bags are the same forces at play that multiplied the pieces of plastic at 34 Fairview. Think about that. Let that sink in for a second. How easy is it? That's not sloppiness. That's evidence manipulation. Mm. That's yep. how in the course of three weeks, those pieces of plastic go from zero to three to five to 47, ever increasing in size with every single search. Now, knowing all that, ask yourself the looming question, who had access to that taillight, the cracked taillight? Who was it? Go back and watch the Sally Cord video. I'll give you the timestamp, 537, and see it for yourself. We know that Trooper Proctor, with binder in hand, walked by himself. Once we corrected the video from being inverted, you can see that he walked back by himself to the right rear taillight where nobody could see what he was doing. Higgins' own key swipes put him in the Sally Port that same afternoon and evening. And then the Sally Port video magically skips and Chief Berkowitz appears right next to Proctor at the back of that vehicle in the same spot and they walk out the, of the Sally Port together. Where were they going? Remember O'Hara, unidentified troopers in Canton Cops were at the search search at 34 Fairview. Hmm. How hard is it? drop a piece of plastic. We spent a long time talking about the compromised and altered and tampered and manipulated evidence. And I will, now I want to switch and talk a little bit about the true facts in this case, because Let's you did do hear this. some true evidence and true facts. You tell Commonwealth it. Commonwealth presented about 67, <laughs> maybe more witnesses and expended 30 plus days of trial and nine weeks of your life. Maybe, maybe we're in the 10th week for what? It should be relatively simple, right? The Commonwealth claims that Karen Reed, Reed pulled up to 34 Fairview, John got out of the car, she reversed into him and hit him, and then she drove home. That's four facts. It's just four facts, that's all it is. What evidence do they actually have to prove that that SUV ever hit John? The answer is none. They don't have any, there's no evidence whatsoever that Karen Reed's vehicle ever struck John O'Keefe or that Karen Reed ever wanted to strike John O'Keefe. In fact, every single piece of material evidence in this case unequivocally proves the opposite. John went into that house. That SUV was not damaged by hitting John. And John's injuries did not come from being hit by a car. That's what the evidence actually shows. The Commonwealth knows that, and they've known it for a long time, and Proctor knows that. And because of that, the Commonwealth just resorts to character assassination and talking for weeks on end about the snow. Let's talk about what the real evidence actually shows, the unassailable science. Let's talk about the truth. Concerning John's injuries first, the Commonwealth's own medical examiner, Dr. Scordy Bello, could not conclude that John was hit by a car. Mm -hmm. Think about that. And she would not even say that it was a homicide. That's a she big told deal. Without any dispute in this case, quote, evidence pointing toward one manner of death is no more compelling than evidence of a competing manner of death, end quote. Right Her there. Words, not mine. She went on to say it's just as likely that he was punched and fell backward. 
his injuries are consistent with that. In fact, in her ex uh, expert opinion, his injuries are consistent with a physical altercation, as she testified, but they are not, in her words, not classical injuries from an auto pedestrian accident. That by itself is reasonable doubt. Yep. But the evidence and the truth goes far further. We introduced you to not one, but two thoroughly credentialed medical examiners or medical experts, Dr. Sheridan and Dr. Russell, both of whom said John's arm injury are, is, is consistent with an animal attack. Dr. Russell studied, diagnosed, and treated a thousand, up to a thousand animal wounds. She's an expert in animal wounds, and she was unequivocal. <laughs> Those wounds are from an animal, likely a large dog, which like means Chloe? that John was attacked inside the home where Chloe was. There is no other possibility. And Dr. Sheridan, for his part, with thousands of autopsies, 13,000 autopsies under his belt, decades of experience as the chief medical examiner who's triple credentialed in anatomical, forensic, and neuropathology. He told you that John's injuries are inconsistent with a motor vehicle accident or incident. They're consistent, however, with a physical altercation. In layman's terms, the science proves John was beaten. That also is reasonable doubt and should end this case. But the facts and evidence don't stop there. Two of the most highly educated and highly qualified engineers you'll ever meet, Dr. Dan Wolf and Dr. Andrew Rinchler, mechanical engineer and a biomechanist. They reviewed this case. They did testing. They did analysis. They evaluated the case scientifically. They were not hired by the defense, not by the Commonwealth. They're completely 100% independent of any party in this case. And they were equally available, by the way, to the Commonwealth. They could have called them. Mm -hmm. They explained that John's That's injuries right. were, not, were not caused by being hit by Miss Reed's SUV and that the SUV was not damaged by coming in contact with John O'Keefe's body. That should end the inquiry right there. Both sides of the equation. From a physics, engineering, and biomechanical standpoint, they established that John O'Keefe was not struck by Karen Reed's vehicle, period. Mm -hmm. And that is yet another fact that establishes reasonable doubt and should put an end to this case. So instead of calling the ARCA experts, which they had available to them, the Commonwealth chose to introduce you to Trooper Joe Paul. You'll remember his testimony. <laughs> I think I'm not when I say that Trooper Paul's analysis lacked credibility. Trooper Paul lacks the experience, the education, the training, the background, and the knowledge to not only render opinions on these issues, but to even understand the issues themselves. He makes the absurd claim that John was hit on the elbow area of his arm by a taillight. He was spun to the left in a pirouette. His arm stayed on the light long enough for the shards of plastic to explode around him, scratching his arm, even though he was wearing long sleeves, uh, then projecting him 30 feet to the left, but not before making a stop to hit his head on either the curb or the pavement before coming to his final resting place with his unbroken phone tucked neatly under his body. Right. It's nonsensical. It borders on laughable. Compare that testimony to Dr. Dan Wolf and Dr. Andrew Rinchler, both PhDs in engineering, both top of their field in accident reconstruction, both published peer review articles on the issues, both men, are highly sought after by the likes of national sports leagues and the United States Department of Defense. And these men are unrivaled in accident reconstruction. What did Dr. Rinchler say before he left the stand? This was even under cross-examination. He said that the physics and the science don't lie. His words were, you can't deny the science and the physics. Yeah. John wasn't mm -hmm. hit by that car. <clears throat> Commonwealth cannot explain John O'Keefe's injuries. They can't explain his head wound. How did he get the head wound if he landed on snow-covered grass and dirt? And by the way, before Mr. Lally gets up and says it, because I know he's going to, there is zero evidence before you, zero, that cold grass and dirt turns into ice or turns <laughs> into concrete. Zero. <laughs> They can't explain the injury above his right eye, that laceration. They can't explain his nose. They haven't even tried to. They can't explain the injury to his tongue, the laceration on his tongue. 
They cannot explain the injuries to, his back, to the back of his hands, the bruises, and certainly they cannot explain the injuries to his right arm. But maybe most importantly, they cannot and haven't even tried to explain the lack of injuries on John's body from the neck down. Nothing. He was pristine. Uh -huh. Not a bump, uh -huh. not a bruise, not a fracture, not a broken bone. Nothing to suggest that he was hit by a 7,000 pound SUV, SUV going 25 miles per hour. And what of that right arm? According to the Commonwealth's best and brightest, Trooper Paul, John absorbed the entirety of the collision, the whole collision, with that three and a half ton SUV entirely with his right arm, launching him <laughs> some 30 feet. But amazingly, the arm suffered no break, no fracture, and didn't even get a bruise. Mm -hmm. So how are those injuries properly explained? The evidence is simple. John got into an altercation. He was punched. He tried to defend himself by putting his hands up. He may have even scratched his own nose by putting his hands in front of his face to defend himself. His hands were bruised and covering up. Five, continued, five minutes, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Your Honor. As he continued, he got hit. Punch went through. You see that? He stared down at the judge. <laughs> Well, he's got five minutes left. Yeah, and he just looked at her like, bitch. Every single injury is explained by that. Ladies and gentlemen, given what we know about the facts and the physical evidence in this case, the actual truth in this case, how did this happen? How did we end up here? We ended up here because of relationships, insider trading, playing the who you know game. Planning evidence. A tall blue wall, which takes decades and generations. But the real changing the evidence. Is it going to continue? Well, this missing evidence. That allows a, a lead detective and his supervisor to gloat and sneer while looking over naked pictures or looking for naked pictures of the woman that they've targeted. Will that continue? And the answer should be not if you have anything to say about it. Michael Proctor is the lead investigator in this case, and much as the Commonwealth might try. They cannot, they cannot distance themselves from the stench of him on this case. In this Amen. Investigation. Those secret group chats illustrate the quality and character of his investigation. Remind yourself how an, quote, unbiased and un, uh, an objective investigator, someone who's supposed to be looking for facts. Ask yourself, how did he approach his job? late at night, sitting there in his office, deviously looking for naked pictures of Karen Reed and talking about her like she's a piece of meat. Mm -hmm. Talking about her bodily functions, her medical conditions, calling her vile names. I don't even have it in me to repeat what he said about her. He reduced Thank you. Her to an object. I didn't either. Earlier when I said he was calling her all sorts of names, mm -hmm. I didn't have it in me because I don't think it's appropriate. Like, it's just not. He humanized her. I'll do that shit to you. You know what I'm saying? You know? I don't do yeah. that shit to you. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and even well. if like we become non-existent family members, I still wouldn't have the time of the day to be blah, 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 Mel. Because right. truly, it ain't worth the time. Well, they're trying to pin a murder on her. So. Yeah, no, I agree. But still. You wish for her to commit suicide. That, ladies and gentlemen is how you frame someone. That's how you dehumanize someone so viciously that you can just pin it on the girl and cover for the homeowner because he's a Boston cop. Mm -hmm. That's how you rip a person's life apart and sleep like a baby while doing it. And then further that by saying, I hope she kills herself. Ladies and gentlemen, I just began the discussion this afternoon or this morning with a quote about the truth. And I did that because that's what this case is about. Top to bottom, tip to tail, it's about the truth. Not hiding it or concealing it, but exposing the truth. The truth is immutable. It's not a feeling, it's not a whim. It's unflinching, it's unchanging, and it's everlasting. That's why the law is steady. That's why it's not captive to the whims of people drunk with power who think they're above the law, who think they're above scrutiny. That's why you stand as the guardian 
of justice and the protector of justice. The law demands the very integrity that Trooper Proctor and his investigation lacks, and it requires that you cannot convict Karen Reed unless the Commonwealth has met its incredibly high burden to prove every element beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty. And a moral certainty is defined as the highest degree of certainty possible in mm -hmm. matters related to human affairs. It's the highest degree possible in your life. That's the level of certainty. <coughs> and I'll leave you with this. You have the most powerful tool known to American jurisprudence because you have your vote. No one can take that away from you. Not me, not the Commonwealth, not the court. You may not have asked to be here, but each of you have given something very special of yourselves. You've agreed to do that, which is the highest calling a citizen can, add, can answer in any way. You've agreed to give your community your best. And my question to you is, what will you do with this moment? Ignore the lies and the manipulations, the misogyny, the bias, the lack of evidence. Could you ever do that? Would you ever do that? Or will you say with your verdict, I see the truth and I will not ever look the other way. When you stare the truth down, you'll see that the Commonwealth has not proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty, not even close. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Reed is innocent. Do justice and find her not guilty. Thank you. That was a brilliant closing. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. That I was agree a brilliant with you. closing. All right, Mr. Lally, sure. Can we just I, talk about that for a second? I think that was a wonderful closing. Like it was perfect. I uh I know yeah. he didn't have enough time, so it literally he was like a page and a half away from actually finishing. I think he said all he needed to say. He definitely like, showed the truth. Uh, you know, pointed fingers at the people who are actually to blame. Mm -hmm. Um, if I was on the jury and not seeing everything that I've seen or what me and you've discussed, mm -hmm. I would have to say not guilty. Yeah. With reasonable I certainty, not guilty. There's just way too many. It's too many reasonable doubts. Right. Too many I, holes. What I appreciated about um, AJ's closing argument is that for the first half, he just used what the prosecution presented. Oh, yeah. It's almost like, you know how Eminem, when he does rap battles, he already knew what they were going to say about him. So he already put it out there in a manner which, yeah, it just took the wind from their sails. I feel like that's what Alan Jackson just did. So now we're going to move on to the um, prosecution's closing. Shall we? Shall we? We shall. Okay. Let me share this. And all right, Lally, you got some pretty big shoes, pretty big shoes to fill. But while we're here, can I just point out, look, here's Brian Albert. Mm -hmm. Who's John O'Keefe's brother. His arms and behind him is probably his son. And behind that. No, that's, been... that's a female. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm saying behind uh, John O'Keefe's brother. Oh. And that's probably uh, Brian that's, Albert's this wife, is, Jennifer. This is, uh, Jennifer is not his wife. Um, This is I right behind John Albert. Or, or I don't know why I said it's his wife. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Right behind John O'Keefe is Colin Albert, I believe. Yeah, that's what I believe. Yeah. And then the wife is in between them. Yeah. So, but this is, let, let's see what Lolly, how Lolly's going to tear out with this. Get a lollipop. You're fired. <laughs> I hit him. I hit him. I hit him. I hit him. Nobody heard her say that, though. Words of the defendant. I'm going to stop. Four times, <laughs> you heard testimony from four different witnesses who overheard and observed those statements from the defendant on January 29th, 
2022. You heard testimony from firefighter Timothy Nuttall. He was trying to bag foul mask uh, Mr. O'Keefe. He was working on resuscitative efforts to try to save Mr. O'Keefe's life. He asked if anyone saw anything or knew what happened. And the defendant said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Firefighter Anthony Lee Fumati was asking if uh, anyone had information on why Mr. O'Keefe was there in the snow. The defendant repeatedly said, I hit him, I hit him, oh my God, I hit him. Firefighter Katie McLaughlin was tasked by firefighter uh, Flamati with asking for biographical information and for what the cause was of the traumatic injuries that all the firefighters testified that they observed on Mr. O'Keefe. She asked the defendant, and the defendant said, I hit him repeatedly. Wait a minute. He's misrepresenting the testimony because all of them testified that they did not actually hear her say it. Yeah, he's going off of uh, Jennifer McCabe's who but said, I hit him, or you get what I'm saying? That's not McCabe's what he just the said. Only person, I, I know, but I get that. But I'm saying yeah. that is the only person I remember ever saying it. Yeah. He and just, now he's trying to say that a bunch of people have said it. What I'm getting in closing arguments, they are presenting and they are summarizing the case that they presented. Yes. And so what he is saying now is that all of these people who came to testify all testified that she said this to them. He's misrepresenting what was testified to because they did not testify to that. They testified, they testified, they didn't actually hear her say it. So for him to stand up there and do that, uh, you know what we got to let, let's just let him roll. It just, it irritates me. He's misrepresenting the truth. And this is what I'm having a, a why I'm, why is the prosecution going second? That I don't, I don't understand. I don't, I don't understand that. And how did that work out like that? Because I've I never know. seen I've it. I've never Usually seen it. Usually prosecution happen. does it first and then it turns around and yeah. Then it goes to the defense defendant. and yeah. then the prosecution can't has one last close. Maybe um, has a rebuttal to Yeah, it's the rebut. Yeah. Yeah. But with this, she's not only letting the prosecution go second. I there's but, just this judge on, is just weird. She she's not only Your letting mom. them go second, but um, she's not allowing the the uh, rebuttal, if for lack of a better term, the rebut. So by the defense, which they would have been entitled to. So it just bothers me how this is it just fa feels so cringe something's just i don't like it firefighter mclaughlin asked for clarification you did what and the defendant repeated i hit him no she didn't say that jennifer mckay stated initially over the phone when speaking with the defendant that the defendant said could i have hit him uh, in the car while they're on the phone with miss roberts going from mr cave's house Mr. O'Keefe's house. Did I hit him? Could I have hit him? Once on scene, once asked, as Ms. McCabe described by an EMT, uh, for name, age, things like that related to Mr. O'Keefe, what caused the trauma? She indicated in her testimony that the defendant said repeatedly, I hit him. Your testimony from Officer Sarah, statements that he attributed to the defendant as saying that morning. This is all my fault. This is all my fault. I did this. This is what the defendant is saying on scene. Since then, the story's changed a little bit. But those were the words that came from the defendant's mouth on January 29, 2022, as John O'Keefe lay dying on the front lawn of 34 Fairview Road, where the defendant had left him after striking him with her motor vehicle several hours before and then left him freezing there in a blizzard. There's certain things uh, that have come up over the course of this trial as far as evidence and testimony are concerned, little things. And what I would suggest to you, it's, it's those little things that are quite telling as it uh, pertains to the defendant's statements and the defendant's actions 
over the course of January 28th, January 29th, and beyond. And I'm going to bring some of those to your attention as I go through, but just ask you to keep that in mind as far as when you're deliberating, when you're reviewing this testimony and this evidence. The little things matter. The little things start piling up in this case. Throughout the course of this trial, you've heard a lot of uh, purported evidence uh, or questions of witnesses in an attempt to distract you from the evidence in this case. It's essentially defense by obfuscation. It's a three-card monitor. The facts and the evidence in this case are your card. They're the queen of hearts. And so what I want you to, or what the defense wants you to do is not look at that card. Look at anything else. Look at movement. Look at this person. Look at that person. Look at text messages. Look at this. Don't pay attention to the facts and the evidence because if you do, what it will, it will ineluctably lead you to is that the defendant is guilty of each of the three indictments before this court. Wow. The evidence and the facts of this case are for you, the jury, to decide. Using your common sense, using your life experiences as your guide through that as you go. Before I turn to that evidence that I, I will submit to you ineluctably demonstrates the defendant's guilt let me first just address Trooper Proctor. The text messages from Trooper Proctor are unprofessional, they're indefensible, they're inexcusable. However, as distasteful as those messages are, and their content is, I submit they had no bearing whatsoever or impact whatsoever on the integrity of the entirety of the investigation that the Massachusetts State Police collectively, collectively conducted into John O'Keefe's death. That's crap. As was asked of Trooper Proctor on cross-examination, these were texts from his personal phone that he never thought would see the light of day. He was asked whether or not he ever thought that he would be asked about these in a courtroom, put to him in sort of a safe space, a safe place for him to discuss, if you will. What do you not see in those text messages? You don't see any discussion or any illusion of any conspiracy, of any framing of the defendant, of any planting of any evidence, no evidence whatsoever. Why? Because it didn't happen. There is Come no on. conspiracy. There is no cover up. There is no evidence of any of that beyond speculation, rampant speculation and conjecture. There's a whole bunch of evidence showing <laughs> that the whole cover up is going on. What the, the Lolly, only you've been smoking that that Lala. That's what you've been yeah. doing. <laughs> the the uh, smoking the, the reef. All this speculation that he's talking about is actually his case. He's he like he's like. There's only a little bit of speculation. You've heard, Proctor and. Everybody else's things is what yeah. you need to listen to. No, don't listen to that shit. Where's my poop screen? We need a poop screen because that's what he's got right now. <laughs> Where's my poopy balls at? Because I there hear it. Go. It's coming straight <laughs> out of his mouth. All that shit. <laughs> Here we go. The text from Trooper Proctor are distasteful, disrespectful, unprofessional. There's no defense to them. And the defendant killed John O'Keefe. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Just drop that. Just, oh, oh, and, and by the way. And the, and the defendant killed John O'Keefe. First, talk a little bit about John <laughs> heard a lot about him in the course of this trial, about his selfless story, uh, to his family and friends that loved him, uh, including uh, his adopted niece and nephew. <clears throat> You heard a lot about the lives he touched and the different people who he had friendships with. You heard a lot about from uh, those particular friends and from his family. Turning to what I would submit to you as a timeline. This may be a little hard to see up here. What I'm going to go is from left to right. January 28th, 2022, 9.49 in the morning, Karen and God, John. Cameraman, thank you. Mm -hmm. 2.25 p.m. in the afternoon, the defendant texts Mr. O'Keefe, tell me if you are interested in someone else. Can't think of any other reason you've been like this. John texts back, nope. 
1925, Mr. O'Keefe texts the defendant, things haven't been great between us for a while, ever consider that. And this is also testimony that you heard through multiple sources, uh, whether it be phone, whether it be from the children, whether it be from other friends or family members as to the relationship uh, in the months and weeks leading up to John's murder. 2.32 p.m., John texts the defendant, sick of always arguing and fighting. It's been weekly for several months now. He then texts the defendant, OMG, stop calling. And this is during the time frame that Trooper Garino was talking about with 18 phone calls, most of which were rejected, some of which were missed, and a couple of which were answered over the course of this afternoon as she's continuing to needle and try to engage uh, him in a fight that he doesn't want to have. 2.33 p.m., the defendant texts John, so you're not into this anymore. 2.34 p.m., John texts the defendant, I am not answering, stop calling. The defendant then texts John, then stop starting with me. 2.38 p.m., the defendant texts John, I'm going to grab a drink in a bit. 2.38 in the afternoon. Around 3 p.m. is the testimony you heard from Aaron O'Keefe in regard to the defendant texting her, asking if she can go out without her husband, Paul, asking him to go out for a drink. This is while Erin O'Keefe testified she was uh, waiting for one of her children at the bus stop, picking that child up around three o'clock in the afternoon. This is also the point in which the defendant says to Ms. O'Keefe, wish I didn't speak to another O'Keefe after 2000. Everything else has a time except for around 3 p.m. Where's that text message at? Wouldn't it have a time too? And I'm still, it's just weird because both of them went, they were lovey dovey all over the, at the bar. Yeah. So where did these text messages fit into that? Now I've been, you know, in a relationship where I've been mad, but then you make up at the end of the night and not that you're breaking up. It's just that I need time to cool off. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It could have been that he found out about her and uh, Higgins and was a little upset and just wanted to be like, hey, look, I just need to cool off. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just weird about these text messages and then seeing them all over each other at the bar. I just it's just weird to me. All right. I'm sorry. 30 p.m. You have Mr. O'Keefe and Mr. Camerano arriving at CF McCarthy's with the defendant arriving at 851. 8.58 p.m. is when the defendant receives drink number one at C.F. McCarthy's. Vodka soda, tall cylinder glass, lime and a strong. 9.13 p.m., drink number two. 9.20 p.m., drink number three. 9.33 p.m., drink number four. 9.57 p.m., drink number five. 10.22 p.m., drink number six. 10.29 p.m., drink number seven. Seven drinks. 851 excuse me 850, that's an hour and 50 like 17 minutes an hour and 17 minutes she drank seven drinks and several others on the next day there's no way and still been able to drive there's no way waterfall well actually one and a half hours hold on hold on i can't hear you both okay go it's one and a half hours because it started right before one and a half so an hour and 32 minutes to drink seven drinks but You're, no one saw her drink seven drinks. This is just what was on a tab. Which could have been John's and everybody else. She just paid the tab and walked out. I don't know. Yeah, They saw her with a couple of drinks, but I mean, seven drinks would be, I mean, she wouldn't have been able to walk. Ne you know? Better or less drive. Especially since, keep in mind, she has MS and Crohn's disease. So she would not have been able to walk or even physically process all of this. And then, I mean, because you got to look at her frame, too. She's tiny. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, And then all of a sudden at 11 o'clock, she gets drink 8 and 9 at the waterfall, but is mm -hmm. walking pretty good. She you was know. fine. Nobody and everybody testified that she didn't look drunk, drunk. She wasn't stumbling, no. nothing. So, yeah, that's that's why this is I, I'm just getting irritated because it's it is misleading. It's very misleading. And I don't think that it's fair that the jury would be left with this. That to me is a cover up. But OK, let's just can we just get through Lolly? Hey, it's up to you. 
I hate. I, 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 I don't know if we can because I just want to punch him in the face. Understanding that some of these drinks are not the full Paul Cylinder drinks. What she's doing is she's getting shot glasses of vodka and then pouring them into the drink after she's consumed. They have no proof of this. 10.54 p.m. The defendant and Mr. O'Keefe arrive at the waterfall during the course Why of the Why isn't there an objection? The they're there, the defendant receives drinks number eight and drinks number nine. 12.10 a.m. from the waterfall video, you have Ms. McCabe, Ms. Polokitis, and the defendant departing the waterfall together. Interestingly, around the same time, you also have the text and screenshot communications between Colin Albert and Allison McCabe in reference to him getting picked up at that time. You also have testimony from Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Caitlin Albert, Brian Albert Jr. in reference to them sort of walking in from the waterfall as Colin Albert is walking out of 34 Fairview Road, gets picked up by Ms. McCabe, and then is driven home. One minute later, 1211, Mr. O'Keefe is then on the waterfall video walking out with cocktail glass in his right hand. At 1214 a.m., Mr. O'Keefe texts Ms. McCabe, where to? 12.14 a.m., based on the fact that she's driving, and Ma'am McCabe indicated... Ms. Why would he text her if they're riding together? While driving, Ms. McCabe calls John O'Keefe. Why at any point isn't anybody saying, okay, if she was that hammered, he's a Boston police officer and a very responsible adult. Do you honestly think a Boston police officer who is raising his niece and nephew, who adopted his niece and nephew so clearly he doesn't want to die, would allow a woman who had eight or nine vodka drinks to get behind the wheel and drive him? No. So that's why this I'm just getting irritated. Speaks with him regarding directions, sort of going over which way to come in, Chapman Street, uh, over Cedar Crest, as far as coming into Fairview Road. 12, 15, 38 a.m., the defendant's vehicle drives by the Canton Library. You can see that on the video. 12, 17, 56, the defendant drives by the Temple Beth Abraham video. Again, you can see that on the video. Remember also the testimony from Lieutenant Tully in regards to the CSLI data and the ranging data in reference to uh, it coinciding with what you observed, the black SUV, from each of those respective videos. 12, 19, 32. Mr. O'Keefe enters 34 Fairview Road into his way zap on his phone. 12.23 a.m. is when the defendant conducts a three-point turn on Cedar Crest and travels back toward Fairview. That's from Mr. O'Keefe's GPS native location data from his phone. <clears throat> Around the same time at 12.23 and 12.24 is when you have that testimony from Ryan Nagel, Heather Maxson, and Richard Cantono um, pulling into Fairview Road around the same time and pulling in behind the dark SUV. 12.25 a.m. is the last native location GPS data of John O'Keefe's phone in that area between 32 and 34 Fairview Road, where his body is discovered the next time, uh, the next morning, in which there is no movement of that phone from that 12.25 a.m. period until Miss Roberts then picks up the phone on the grass underneath Mr. O'Keefe's body uh, sometime after 6 a.m. Wouldn't it be on snow because it was snowing? That data, the mm -hmm. points that Trooper Garina was testifying about as far as the movement of the vehicle. The movement of the vehicle as it comes down. Cedar Crest passes by Fairview, reverses direction, and then comes down Fairview. I have no clue. I have no oh, idea oh, what he's talking about. He didn't bring this. Oh, they're showing the car. Oh, okay. As it did a three-point turn because it missed the turn to 34 fear view. With the vehicle control history database uh, information from the Toyota text stream, which you now have up on the screen before you here, indicating that following that three-point turn, approximately eight minutes after that, from Trooper Paul's testimony, as far as the mileage, 36 to 38 miles, matching up with the time that the vehicle is in front of 34 Fairview Road. Where's 34 Fairview? In reverse. It's okay. down there near 143. Okay. okay. At the bottom. Per hour, 62 and a half feet with a minor steering angle uh, change, which the trooper indicated uh, was consistent with a pedestrian collision. 
At 12.30 a.m. I still doubt this. Event, eight minutes after of course. The three point turn when the vehicle's in reverse at 24.2 miles an hour. 12.35 is when the defendant uh, calls John and that's unanswered. 12.36 is around the time that the defendant's phone connects to the Wi-Fi at One Meadows Ave, Mr. O'Keefe's home. 12.37 is when the defendant leaves this voice. Isn't that cute? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So within minutes of that vehicle's data going 24.2 miles an hour in reverse for 62 and a half feet. She's calling him. Work. So they're hurting Sitting their own case. As she's screaming, John, I fucking hate you. Oh, look at his brother. 1240 to 1242. Miss McCabe is texting Mr. O'Keefe. She tries calling Mr. O'Keefe. Gets no answer. Let me ask you this, Tommy. I've never said it. Well, I did, but then I got divorced afterwards because I wanted to, and I meant it. But have you ever said to anybody, when you're angry and not meant it, I fucking hate you? Yeah. Yeah. And in a relationship, have you ever said it? I fucking hate you. Yeah. So, yeah. I, that's why I'm just like, he's out at a bar. She's taking care of And it's the not something I use all the time, but I have said it, you know, I hate that you do this or you know what I'm saying? Like, I fucking hate you right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I've said it. Mm -hmm. That's, I forgot what I was going with that. But we'll just recall from her testimony <laughs> around this time frame, about 1240, she was unsure whether the vehicle was actually still out front or if it had gone at that point. But she was looking for John because she had seen the defendant's vehicle in front of the house and no one had come in. So she was wondering where her friend Mr. O'Keefe, 12.55, the defendant texts John, see you later. 12.59, the defendant calls, leaves another voicemail for Mr. O'Keefe. Exhibit 637, it sounded like this. John, I'm here with your fucking kids. Nobody knows what the fuck you are, you fucking pervert. But somebody did know where Mr. O'Keefe was, the defendant. Knew exactly where it was. She had driven him there. She had struck him there. She had left him to die. 102 a.m., the defendant leaves another voicemail with no content. And then she texts John, Your kids are fucking alone. 109 a.m., the defendant texts John, I'm back in Mansfield. The kids are home alone. She's not. GPS, uh, you know, as far as the, it never disconnects from the Wi-Fi until the following morning. There's no indication that Ms. Reed left and went to her home in Mansfield at any point. 1.10 a.m., the defendant calls her parents. 1.11 a.m., she calls Mr. O'Keefe and leaves. Hey, pause it real quick. I, 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 I'm starting to wonder, like, maybe he was just stopping by and he was going to catch a ride with somebody to bring him back to his house. I don't know. I, like I'm, just I'm not going to gonna add any more. I can't. I can't add any just, more possibilities. Just by all this going on, that's just what I'm thinking. Like, anyways, just go. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I'm going home. I cannot. And part of the reason why, I'm sorry, uh, viewers, here's the thing. When you're a juror, when you're watching these trials, as a juror, you cannot, it is explicit. You can't come up with your own suppositions or hypotheticals. You can only consider what's been brought in. Court. Yeah. You can't create anything new. And I feel like he's creating this whole narrative that's not fitting with what the well, whole case happened. Well, this is what he claimed. And this is what he's claiming the prosecution has shown. But the prosecution has never once suggested that he was waiting for like an Uber or someone else to pick him up because that wouldn't make sense because the prosecution is alleging that within seconds of dropping him off, she hit him. She's so angry. At 9 a.m., the defendant leaves another voicemail. Now, about 1.43 or 1.45 a.m. is when Julie Nagel, 
testified that they were leaving the house. And she sees a large black object uh, on the lawn near the flagpole while leaving 34 Fairview Road. Doesn't think much of it at the time, isn't expecting Mr. O'Keefe or anybody uh, to be out on the front lawn. 4.42 a.m. The defendant calls and speaks. So the calls to her parents are, are finally answered. 4.49 a.m. The defendant calls uh, Ms. Camerano, screaming, where's Mike? 4.53 in the morning is when the defendant instructs Haley, who serves his needs, to call Ms. McCabe. Why? Because the defendant doesn't have Ms. McCabe's phone number. Indicates that John didn't come home. We got in a fight, and I left him at the waterfall. Those are the first statements or the first version of events uh, that she's able to communicate out to the world as to what happened. Yeah, it was Colin Albert, Albert behind John, Al John O'Keefe's brother. I left him at the Again, that statement I think was hearsay. I don't think that was a text message. Terry, 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 Terry hangs up the phone. In closing arguments, there's no such thing as hearsay. 501. The defendant calls Terry Roberts again. And it's at this point that she indicates that John's dead. He must have been hit by a plow. <coughs> 507 a.m. The defendant leaves one meadow dab. You have the video uh, of that. It's number 153 in Exhibit 6. <clears throat> we'll get to that a little more in a moment. About 5, 10 a.m., the defendant calls Kerry Roberts. Uh, Ms. Roberts uh, starts calling hospitals, calling HCP, <coughs> calling 911, something that you would do if you didn't know where Mr. O'Keefe was for all of these hours, that all of these other phone calls are being made and these text messages are being sent, and calling your parents, and all of these other things. No calls to 911 from the defendant while John O'Keefe is laying, freezing, and dying from a brain injury and a skull fracture on the front lawn of 34 Fairview Road. 5.11 a.m., the defendant's vehicle is seen on the Canton Library camera heading towards the waterfall. Seems to be sort of retracing the steps. 5.18 a.m., the defendant's vehicle is seen at Washington Street and Chapman on the Temple Beth Abraham video heading in the same direction that it was the night before when it was heading to 34 Fairview Road. 5.35 is when the defendant arrives at Ms. McCabe's house. Ms. Roberts arrives shortly thereafter. Both of them see the broken taillight at that time in the driveway. Now that gap of 5.18 to 5.35 is way too much time to be driving from the area of the waterfall to Jennifer McCabe's house. And as I indicated a moment before, heading in the same direction, same directionality, retracing the steps from the night before, heading towards 34 Fairview Road. Why is it that the defendant can see Mr. O'Keefe when they eventually get to Fairview Road and no one else can? It's because she knew exactly where he was. She had hit him and left him there the night before, and she had gone back during that time frame between 5, 18 a.m. when she's seen on the Temple video and 5.35 when she arrives at Ms. McCabe's house. 5.23, I'm sorry, 5.33 is when the defendant, Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts return to One Meadows Ave searching for John. 6.03 is when the defendant, and no one else, spots Mr. O'Keefe's body buried in the snow. Probably because she just pulled up indicating uh, this cruiser camera video, which I know you've seen a dozen times. Uh, so where I'm starting it from this point in this card right here is the spotlight that Officer Sarif had to use in order to locate, even with the vehicle of Ms. Roberts, parked right in the middle of the road. In the darkness, in the snow, in the blizzard, in those conditions, the defendant sitting in the back seat of the vehicle knows exactly where Mr. O'Keefe is, covered in snow, as you heard from all of the paramedics, from the civilian witnesses, from the first responders. And the defendant knows exactly where he is. <clears throat> 6 07 a.m., Ms. McCabe calls 911. 6 08, the defendant leaves. Uh, that four or five minute voicemail uh, leaving the 
phone in the car for some reason uh, to uh, Mr. O'Keefe's phone. 6.23 and 6.24 in the morning is when Ms. McCabe conducts those Google searches. 7.50 in the morning is when Mr. O'Keefe is pronounced uh, deceased at Good Samaritan Hospital. 4.13 to 4.20 p.m. is when the defendant's SUV is towed uh, from her parents' house in Dighton. 5.20 p.m. is when the search team arrives in the area of 34 Fairview Road to conduct the search for evidence. 5.30 p.m. is when the defendant's vehicle arrived at the Canton Police Department south. We circle back. They find something amusing at the defense table. Mr. O'Keefe, to his families, to his friends, and to his relationship with the defendant. We heard testimony from Paul and Aaron O'Keefe that they liked the defendant, that they thought he was good for John, thought he was good for the kids. All outward appearances of the relationship were good. We heard testimony from the children that that was not true behind closed doors. But Paul O'Keefe <coughs> testified that he told the defendant's parents this, that he liked Ms. Green, that he thought that she was good for John, thought that she was good for the kids, weeks before John's murder. He even blew her a kiss in the emergency department at Good Samaritan uh, as he was walking out and she was still being treated while they were there. Invited her over to John's house to grieve with him. Invited her to sit down with him while he explained to their nephew Patrick about John's past. Bennett shows up at the house, abruptly goes upstairs with her father for a period of about 15 minutes, which is about half of the time that she spent there that morning grieving with the family. She left with a bag of her belongings, drove with her family there, and then took an extra vehicle in the height of the blizzard around 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, drives that vehicle all the way from King where it was parked at her boyfriend's house, where she stayed over on many occasions, drove that vehicle or felt the need to drive that vehicle from Canton all the way down to her parents' house in Dighton at the height of the blizzard. You heard testimony from Aaron O'Keefe of the text messages on, in the phone call on January 28th. <clears throat> heard that Erin O'Keefe called the defendant on the morning of the 29th because she was concerned for her. She wanted to know what was going on with someone she considered her friend. The defendant yells, John is dead. Ms. Robertson grabs the phone and then updates Erin O'Keefe as to what's going on with John. Erin O'Keefe again calls back later because she's concerned for someone that she considered her friend. How does the defendant respond? These are some of the little things. Defendant indicates to Ms. O'Keefe that she just has to remember the bad times and indicates to her, I don't think I'll ever see you guys. This is after she's done her quick in and out at One Meadows Ave and is now with her parents and with her father, driving that car, essentially taking the murder weapon from Canton and bringing it down to her parents' house in Dyke. She's indicating over the phone to Aaron O'Keefe, I don't think I'll ever see you guys again. Why? <coughs> If she didn't kill John, why would she say that? You heard a lot of testimony about New Year's Eve and a roof. <clears throat> you heard the testimony from Ms. O'Keefe in regards to them exchanging, her and the defendant exchanging text, text messages uh, on the flight down, arranging times to meet up. Um, and then the defendant telling Aaron uh, via text message. What does it have to do with anything, Aruba? In the hotel lobby. Big effing deal. About it, and then they never met, them, meaning the defendant. O'Keefe got into an argument about it. And she that was not even in this country. Who cares? Oh, my Her God. testimony consisted from Laura Sullivan, Marietta Sullivan, as well as the children. The kiss never happened. It never would happen based on the relationship, the godfather relationship that John O'Keefe had with Laura Sullivan, her family, and particularly Laura Sullivan's child. The defendant persists with this unfounded suspicion and accusations of infidelity in her text messages. Well, you know, in fairness, her um, suspicions and accusations of him cheating is far less, uh, uh, I would say, an insult than, I don't know, unfounded accusations of murder. Dun, dun, dun. 
text messages with Mr. Higgins, where she's accusing Mr. O'Keefe of making out in the lobby with Marietta Sullivan. Both of the Sullivans and the children have the defendant and uh, Mr. O'Keefe following this incident with Marietta Sullivan going into a room. Who cares? The children testified that they're in that room for about 20 to 25 minutes. People they're argue. And they're arguing about the defendant indicating that Mr. O'Keefe kissed someone in the lobby. And you have Laura Sullivan's testimony. About 20 to 25 minutes after her sister comes out and states her displeasure of, about the defendant, <clears throat> it's about 20 to 25 minutes before Mr. O'Keefe comes out, and then he and Ms. Sullivan have a conversation. Words, words. This is all I'm hearing is words. Mr. Phone is essentially blowing up, lighting up with calls and texts from the defendant. I would submit similar to the afternoon of January 28th. Mr. O'Keefe says she's crazy and he needs to take this and goes off from there. Ms. Sullivan has later conversations with Mr. O'Keefe on this Aruba trip, asks him if, he, if he's okay, asks him if he's happy. She indicated in her testimony that Mr. O'Keefe shrugs it off and says it is what it is. You heard testimony from the children about the arguments in the weeks and the months. And I know this is a displeasure to defense counsel that the children came in and actually testified as to what happened behind closed doors. It's not like they were toddlers, bro. They're teenagers. They both recall frequent fights. They both recall Mr. O'Keefe trying multiple times to break up with the defendant, asking her to leave the house, the defendant refusing to leave the house. Her, uh, his niece, Kaylee, John tried to uh, defuse, she tried to walk away, and the defendant would follow each time during each argument. <laughs> I hate that. Yeah. They both indicated that Mr. Women do that. The, the, the relationship had run its course. <laughs> Similar to language within the text messages you have between the defendant and Mr. O'Keefe. That Mr. O'Keefe was sick of arguing. Again, mirroring those text messages from January 28th, leading up into going out to see if McCarthy is eventually the waterfall and the defendant killing Mr. O'Keefe uh, in the early morning hours of January 29th. We have the testimony in regard to the ring camera. Kaylee indicated in her testimony that John had had that for about a year. So during the course of two years or so of the relationship with the defendant, he got it while he was dating the defendant. The defendant okay. had to go to the garage. Big Neither after of deal. the kids had access to the camera. Trooper Garino checked the laptop and the desktop that were left after the defendant did the quick cleanup upstairs with her father. But neither did Karen Reed, the one who did have access to uh, the ring camera footage, was Trooper Proctor. Well, like I said before, the video came up missing. Some of the video came up yeah, missing. Because Trooper Proctor had the phone, which had the access to the ring cameras. That's what the defense is, it, uh, is putting forward. And that's what it kind of sounded like uh, on cross that Trooper Proctor... I mean, he didn't deny it. The only access was through the he phone. He said, well, I, did, I didn't get the evidence, or I didn't get the, the videos. It was sent to me. But he had the phone. And they got proof the ring. that, that he, there was a video at yeah. that time. So Neither of those devices had access to the ring cameras. John had access on his phone. I'm going to speed this up just a little. Indicates, if you recall, because he's making me mad. In regard to the romantic kiss that she placed on Mr. Higgins uh, earlier on January, uh, whatever it was. Or in January, I'm making Lolly speak fast. Mr. Jackson was indicating weren't very good friends with Mr. O'Keefe, but had been invited home for a Patriots game, in which time the defendant escorted Mr. Higgins out of the garage and placed a romantic kiss on him. But during those text messages, when they're talking about that, if you recall, the defendant is saying something or joking about something that Mr. O'Keefe had been looking at the videos and had been asking her if there was something going on with her and Mr. Higgins. And what was her response? To her? I know where the cameras are. So, I know where the cameras are from that ring set. on my neighbor's house. One being the defendant getting to Mr. O'Keefe's house after murdering him, and the other when the defendant is showing Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts the broken taillight, both of which, both Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts testified as having occurred. No video. Oh, she was showing that she broke the taillight? Defendant tells the Bullshit. Bullshit. Text messages and voicemails from the defendant to Mr. O'Keefe. 53 phone calls from 1233 a.m. to 603 a.m. Zero phone calls to 911. <clears throat> the defendant calls Katie Camerano. 
And then it calls her parents at 1 18 in the morning, 4 38 in the morning, 4 42. Because somebody else probably called. Call She's probably in shock at that time. Ms. McCabe, no, she did call. Have Ms. McCabe's uh, phone number. Um, <clears throat> both Kaylee and Ms. McCabe indicate that the defendant initially indicates or says that she got into a fight with Mr. O'Keefe and left him at the waterfall. From this information, Ms. McCabe then testifies she starts to call her uh, Julie Albert. Because Chris Aww. Albert and Julie Albert, they live close by the waterfall. Maybe that's where he went. As the phone is ringing, and this is a phone call that both Ms. Albert and Ms. McCabe testify was never answered. As the phone is ringing, her husband, Matthew McCabe, reminds her that they saw the defendant and Mr. O'Keefe in the car outside of 34 Fairview. So she hangs up. She doesn't remember During seeing them call, and texting them on her own? Indicates Ms. McCabe, maybe I hit him. Did I hit him? She then calls Ms. Roberts at 5 a.m. on the dot, indicates John's dead, hangs up the phone, calls back a minute later, indicates that Mr. O'Keefe was now hit by a plot and that he's dead. And then indicates further that she's drunk and doesn't remember. She tells Ms. McCabe about the crack tail light before they even get in the vehicle and go anywhere, as you recall the testimony of Matthew McCabe, indicating that he has some concerns about them driving around uh, in a vehicle with a damaged tail light in the middle of a blizzard. Ms. Roberts' testimony that she saw the broken tail light in the driveway at Ms. McCabe's house, and that it was consistent with what she observed in the photographs that were shown to her of it later in the Sally Port at the Cannon Police Department garage when the search warrant is executed on February 1st. <clears throat> hmm. You have the text messages between the defendant and Laura Sullivan from January 29th, in which the defendant indicates to Laura Sullivan that John is dead, indicates that we found him in the snow at 5 a.m. And every indication is that he was found in the snow by the defendant, Mr. McCabe, and Ms. Roberts around 6 a.m. 5 a.m. would be about an hour before. 5 a.m. would be between that time of where the defendant is unaccounted for, heading in the direction of 34 Fairview Road, 518-535. Little thing. Yeah, it's the little things the I'm not getting because none of this is. What does this have to do? I don't, I don't get what he's. This is. I mean, honestly, did did this come up in, in direct? Because this don't make no sense with what. So at 623 and 624 in the morning, you have the testimony of Ms. Hyde and Mr. Whitman as the SQLite databases, P-List databases, Knowledge C databases, uh, State DB tabs, uh, as far as all of them, also from Trooper Marino as well. These searches were unequivocally done at 623, 624 in the morning, and not at 227 and 40 seconds in the morning. They were not deleted by a user. That is not what deleted means. Frankly, Mr. Green. That's not what deleted means. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. Was he aware? That uh -huh. uh, state DB tabs, uh, as far as all of them, also from Trooper Marino as well. These searches were unequivocally done at 6:23, 6:24 in the morning, and not at 2:27 and 40 seconds in the morning. They were not deleted by a user. That is not what deleted means. Frankly, Mr. Green, the last question that I asked Mr. Green is: Was he aware that Selbright, and by Selbright, the person who designed that, being Mr. Whitman, uh, had to alter uh, exactly how their uh, software works because of people like Mr. Green misinterpreting the data as he did in this case. And what did Mr. Green say? Yes. So he, if he took it into consideration, as far as how long to die in the cold, I would submit near the questions. In it, Mr. Green, I did go back and watch his testimony, Tommy. He broke it down that no, this di text did occur at this time, not to mention. There was a lot of other texts that were deleted and other content that was deleted. And when Lolly asked this question, he was like, yeah, I, I did know about that. And he brought in all of this other technical stuff as to why and what showed that, yeah, it did occur at this time. If Selbright is that much of a problem now, where the reports are leading to confusion, then maybe they should change the terminology. Or not use cell break. Or not use cell break. If you recall those, she asked Firefighter Whitley how long to die in the cold without a jacket. She knew how Mr. O'Keefe was dressed. She knew when she left him to die in the cold how he was dressed. So she asked somebody but else she how long... What the fuck? They're claiming that the next morning, Karen Reed asked um, Jen McCabe to Google search how long to take to die in the cold. But 
That doesn't even make sense because Karen Reed is a very, very intelligent. She's a professor anyway. She would know about hypothermia, but even if she didn't, she didn't talk to Jen McCabe at 227 in the morning. Yeah. But sure. prosecution said that, oh, no, that's not how that works. I made statements to Firefighter Becker. That's the last time that she saw Mr. O'Keefe. They were in an argument. Again, in the back of the same ambulance as Firefighter Whitman. You have testimony from Firefighter Woodbury. Same kind of questions. If Mr. O'Keefe could be alive without a jacket. You have the testimony from each of these firefighters as to sort of the vacillating. The ones that don't remember anything. Yeah. None of them also, they also all testified. They never heard her say, I hit him. But each of those first responders indicate that the defendant repeatedly stated, is he dead? Is he dead? Not, is he okay? You know what, though? And Tommy, this is me and you. Uh, where we can, because I don't think Lolly has ever been through this. When you lose someone so tragically or when, you know, you are going to efforts to saving someone's life or you love someone and you find their body or they're right there or they're they died right in front of you. What have you? Shock is a crazy thing. That's what I said earlier. She she was in shock. Yeah. People react differently. And I will tell you. It is not uncommon for people to be screaming, is he dead? He's dead. Oh my God. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. Is he dead? Is he dead? It's actually not uncommon for you'd be for that utterance. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It is a natural response because it you're trying to process. You don't want it, you don't want it to be, but yeah, you're still in shock. And then, but you want to know because yeah, again, you're trying to save his life, you know? And you also want someone else to say no. You want someone to say no. And and it's more like disbelief when it's coming out of your mouth. I know for me, it was just like, I could see the deceased. I could see they weren't coming back. There was nothing I could do, but I, you still can't help. No, no, no. He's okay. He's okay. Is he dead? Is he dead? Oh my God. He's fucking dead. He's fucking dead. You know, come on, man. So yeah, long. I that uh, means first nothing to experience, me. you know, nine fucking deployments. I can tell you firsthand experience, you know, you question everything you, you, you get mm -hmm. down and you just, I'm just going to say during the 2003 to 2005, the 101st had a 99% chance to save you. It was, it was you calling a medevac. They were there flight line crews, your medics and stuff like that. But, you know, when I lost my LT, I knew I lost them. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, but there are ones that I question, like, hey, can we save them? You know, do the presses, do tourniquets, you know, and then we get them on the flight line or, you know, the bird comes in from the nine line and uh, you get them on the bird. And that's what you're asking. Like, hey, is there any response? Is he is he dead? Or are they dead? That's I'm gonna put it like that. But are they even dead? outside of that controlled? It's more like in an uncontrolled setting, which is what I'm thinking of, because that's the setting that Karen reads in, not yeah. where you know that all these processes processes are are being done, but that initial shock that your that your friend or your loved one, they're it's gone. They're gone, and you can't believe it. And you're like, he's dead. He's dead. Or is he dead? Is he dead? Look at films, uh, true, you know, documentaries, and you'll see that common reaction amongst troops and soldiers and sailors and airmen when, you know, in a firefight or something and, uh, you know, a battle gets hit. So yeah. I, I just, let's, okay, Lolly, we're trying so hard to get through him, but he's so. He's dry. I don't know he, why. He's, he's just dry. not entertaining. It, it's not, yes, he's not it's, only not entertaining. It's like he's saying the same not, shit over and over and over I'm and not over. buying it. And yeah. I think that's the problem is like, I'm just really not buying the bullshit. And it's irritating and angry because it's like, uh, stop trying to make it real. It isn't so. It isn't you. Just because you say it doesn't make it true. Okay. He's going to be okay. How is he? Any sort of questions about the medical condition? Is he dead? That phraseology repeated over and over and over again. And when you take into juxtaposition, that phraseology. Phraseology? 
Text the Lord's help. I'm telling you, take into account it should have been what he said. When you <laughs> take he goes when you That's he goes when you, when you take into to take into what? Phraseology. But you know what? That's not a word. That's not a word. Counted four times, heading in the direction of 34 Fairview Road, 518 to 535. The repeated questioning, Firefighter Whitney, Firefighter Woodbury, asking Miss McCabe to actually it is a word. She's looking for confirmation is what she's looking for when she asks over and over again, is he dead? Is he dead? Is he dead? You have the testimony that you heard uh, from Miss McCabe and Miss Robert. I apologize, Lolly. Phraseology is a word. I say them together because as far as these two women were concerned, they did not know each other really at all. The only time is they both testified to that they ever spent appreciably together prior to January 29, 2022 is when Mr. O'Keefe nicely took them out for sneakers uh, because he had some sort of deal at a Reebok outlet or something like that uh, to go try to pay them back for the help that they provided him and the children. Jennifer with respect to uh, the niece and Kerry with respect to the nephew. But they're both contacted you anything? Uh, by the defendant in the early morning of January 29th. As Mr. McCabe testified, John was my friend. I love John. He was an amazing guy. At the waterfall, Mr. Alberts uh, said going home to have a drink with his son, Brian Jr., if anyone wants to come. Open invitation to the city. She said to Mr. O'Keefe and the defendant, you guys should come. Both the defendant and the victim indicated that they wanted to come and that they were coming. She describes the phone calls and the text messages that she receives from Mr. O'Keefe, which is providing directions. She indicates she's providing them directions to go down Chapman. She describes how that is. And you've heard this testimony from a couple of different witnesses as far as the steepness as you're going down Chapman, excuse me, going down Fairview or coming off Chapman. If you first go down a big, steep hill, it flattens out for a little bit, and then you go down a second hill. Two hills going down on Chapman, matching the GPS native location and the health data as far as where the Mr. O'Keefe's phone is, a half mile away from 34 Fairview Road at the time that his health data is recording that he's ascending or descending three flights of stairs. You hear the testimony from Ms. McCabe as far as the last time that she spoke to Mr. O'Keefe. And she's still trying to provide directions to Fairview because Mr. O'Keefe has never been there before and neither has the defendant which is further corroborated in Trooper Garino's testimony as far as the vehicle passing by Fairview and then coming back in on the other side, having to reverse direction. But she's giving directions and she indicates that she uses uh, a house that Mr. O'Keefe will be familiar with, that belonging to Bella or Bella's mom. Bella's is he mom making up a new scenario a or is... Long time ago. However, <laughs> in the defendant's mind... Battle, I don't know. I'm... I'm, I I'm lost in the sauce, Lolly. Re you know summarize the evidence he's giving us a whole story but i don't he talked see about how two hills and is... john o'keefe's data matching that he went up and downstairs because of those hills doesn't work like that lolly yeah uh, uh, it's uh, uh, just finish this out please because i'm bored I, I i can't i i don't she's still talking about the next morning I'm Thank sorry, you. viewers. Riding, going towards Fairview Road with Miss Roberts and Miss McCabe in Miss Roberts' car. She's still talking about that at that time. It's that much on her mind. Is it, though? Miss McCabe indicated uh, that she looked out and she saw the vehicle initially in front of the front door as did Mr. McCabe, as did Brian Albert Jr., as did Julie Nagel, as did Brian Nagel, and the vehicle moved up several times or several spots to where it was then positioned. Oh, I gotta see. Initially, at some point, in front of the door. Uh, moves up further. So okay, so we're right close. Right the flagpole when Mr. O'Keefe's body was uh, discovered uh, later on that morning, at least by Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts, and then moves up further beyond that. And I say that in the sense that it moves up further beyond that with sufficient distance for it to then go in reverse for 62 and a half feet at 24.2 miles per hour, striking Mr. O'Keefe and leaving No flipping way. Again, Listen, after seeing the 3D rendering that you showed me, there's no flipping way. Lolly. The testimony from Ms. McCabe that about 12.40 when she's texting him, she indicated in her testimony she couldn't be certain if Mr. O'Keefe was still out front or had left at that point. She wakes up to a phone call from John's niece, Kaylee, 4.53 in the morning. This is from an eighth grader. See, we're back on the freaking timelines again, and I don't understand. Is, is this your base case is timelines and a bunch of, and I'm going to say this again, a bunch of hearsay from everybody that you're making this, this crap up. He's trying to put together a timeline to make it easier for the jurors to understand it's not, how it's his case is easier. possible. But it's it's not so. 
we got to finish this out. We have to, otherwise we'll be incomplete. I, I'm, I'm literally done talking about this. <laughs> in the case of the defendant, we saw you outside of my sister's house. Then she starts yelling, Jen, Jen, did I hit him? Could I hit him? Then they start discussing what the defendant brings up for crack tail. And then here, her, well, Ms. McCabe and Mr. McCabe hear the defendant screaming outside of their home at about 5 o'clock in the morning, shortly after 5 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> they go to Mr. O'Keefe's house. And both Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts indicate, and you heard this testimony from a number of different witnesses, friends and family of Mr. O'Keefe, that he had a rule, pretty strict rule in his house as far as you take your shoes off when you come in the house. So what did Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts both do when they're entering in that house on January 29th? They take off their boots, they come out in the snow, they take off their boots in the mudroom, and then they walk in. What did they both indicate that the defendant did that morning when she came back to the house? They walked right in with the shoes. You hear that second. You're muted. Well, yeah, because, you know, where your boyfriend, your where you spend half of your time in uh, with is dead. Do you really think? I give two fucks about whether or not my shoes are on because I I, I don't wear shoes in my house. Uh, I'd make you everybody gotta, uh, shoes off. This is her first time walking in that house. She didn't know the rules probably. About no, she taking did. Boots off. Yeah, she did. She stayed. At, she stayed with John. I guarantee she was time. like, they were like, hey, just come in here and sit down. Don't worry about your boots. I guarantee that's what exactly. Wait. I don't care. Just roll no, the footage. I'm done. No, listen, this is important because I don't want our viewers to get the wrong information. This is going into John O'Keefe's home. She lived there half the time. So why would, where, but she's freaking out because he's dead. So why would she take her shoes off? No, no, no. I don't understand this because literally I think they're still at the 34 Fairview. No, no. He's talking about when they went back. Okay. Roll it. I see how confused I am. I know me too. Reconnected with Mr. O'Keefe's wife. Yeah. See. Okay. There it is. Okay. You win. That may be in the garage, or that might be in the house. Why is it that the defendant has no issue with wearing shoes in the house when Mr. O'Keefe has that strict rule? Because she knows where he is. No. Because it's not that important. There's more important things to focus on, and it's finding him. Ms. Roberts and Ms. McCabe. Frantically sort of running around the house looking for Mr. O'Keefe. Then it's not. They then get in the vehicle. They drive back uh, towards Fairview Road. And again, the defendant from the back seat of the vehicle immediately sees the defendant, starts pulling and kicking on the door, and runs in sort of a beeline straight over to where Mr. O'Keefe is laying on the front lawn. You have the testimony from Ms. Roberts. As far as John's phone. John's phone, when the firefighters pick him up, and recall several witnesses testifying about that, pick him up on the scoop stretcher and they bring him over to the ambulance while they're conducting resuscitative efforts trying to save Mr. O'Keefe from him. But Ms. Roberts indicates that she observed underneath not only the phone, but the phone on the grass. On the grass in the area that is completely covered in snow in every other area except under Mr. O'Keefe. I would submit indicates how long Mr. O'Keefe has been there. Now, recall around 12 o'clock or so is when it starts to snow and it starts to stick a little bit. And you heard all that testimony. And I know it was a hey, lot. Hey, pause of it real testimony. quick. A lot of testimony. New York, it snows a lot, right? And when you lay down in the snow, it doesn't just melt away and show grass. You're in a foot of powder, right? You're on it, your body heat. Let's just say this it wouldn't just melt away and be no snow laying right there unless your body's been there for a while and the snow piled up on top of him you get what i'm saying like i get it they're in the middle of a blizzard but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me at you know below you 32 mean, degrees good. at below 32 degrees it snows right below 32 mm -hmm. degrees your body heat with your clothes on and everything laying there is not going to make it melt where it's, it's just pure grass underneath. It's going to be snow. Not necessarily depending on the mass of the individual. And if they run hot where they're back and uh, where they're laying on 
um, it will generate the body heat. I snowboard, and I can tell you, I've made snow angels and laid in the snow for hours, and now no grass appeared underneath my body. Okay, I'm not talking about snowboarding in the mountains. I'm just Jesus saying, right, Mel? Listen to what I'm saying for once, instead of just I interrupting did. me. I have laid in the snow, and it's not melted. It's not melted. It showed grass underneath. It's just not possible. I'm only about weather, but there's a purpose to that. There's a point to that. Okay. As far as the grass underneath Mr. O'Keefe's body, where his cell phone was, Miss Roberts observed some six hours later after it starts snowing, is still visible only under Mr. O'Keefe where his body is. Which I would submit as evidence to you as to how long he's been here. Now, on top of that, you also have hours. Of, of ring videos of, of the driveway as far as shoveling and, and Paul O'Keefe and other people snow blowing and shoveling and all those kinds of things. There's a purpose to that as well. If you look at those, if you look at the video of the defendant crashing into Mr. O'Keefe's vehicle at a speed of, of anywhere from zero to five, which even Dr. Wolf would uh, indicate would not cause the damage to the taillight uh, that was observed in this case. You know what you don't see? You don't see snow move off Mr. O'Keefe's vehicle when they come into contact. You don't see any red or clear plastic pieces in the snow. And if you look at those stills, not the ones that counsel put up there during his closing, but if you look at each of the video in the stills, you can see the damage consistent with the taillight at each and every point. You see the damage consistent with the taillight from the 507 video. You see the damage consistent from the 822 video from Lieutenant Ray from the through the camera video when he's pulling into the driveway. You see the damage consistent from the Dighton video at the defendant's home. You see the <clears throat> damage consistent from the right here, February 1st, 2022, when the search warrant is conducted, Ms. Hartnett removes all those pieces from the vehicle. The weather is also important when it comes to the hair, the magic hair, as Mr. Jackson likes to call it. See, the magic hair was actually frozen to the vehicle, as was the glass to the bumper, because the vehicle looked like that on the left when it was caked in snow. When Officer Barrow saw it in the driveway in Dighton, that they were wading through a foot and a half of snow, walking up, because remember, they didn't even pull into the driveway because they had to have someone come down and plow it before they could get into it. That's what the vehicle looked like. <clears throat> what you can see, however, is the damage to the taillight, to the side of that taillight, consistent with it. So that hair, that seven-eighths of an inch hair, was frozen to the side. And as you remember, the testimony from Sergeant Mechanic about the heated condition of the Canton Police Department garage, and that's one of the reasons that they took it there, because the other barracks that they could have taken it to didn't have that heated condition. So yes, after it's been in there from January 29th at about 5.30 p.m. until February 1st when they conduct the search warrant, the hair isn't still frozen as it's contained within the heated garage, and the pieces of glass on the rear bumper have melted. The snow has melted, as you can see from left to right. The weather, also important, I would submit, weather was a weapon. Remember, the cause of death here is not just blunt impact injuries, it's blunt impact injuries and hypothermia. And you've heard all that medical testimony in relation to it, and you've heard all that testimony in relation to the snow and the weather and the wind. Wind gusts up to 37 miles per hour while he's out, Mr. O'Keefe is out there in just a shirt, in jeans. Now, you heard also testimony from uh, Ms. Roberts in, re in relation to the injuries she observed to Mr. O'Keefe that... Initially on scene, uh, there was one eye that was swollen, not the other. And so that's indication of the swelling that Dr. Scotty Bell was testifying to and no indication of physical altercation. And then both eyes being swollen when Ms. Roberts viewed Mr. O'Keefe's body after his passing at the Good Smith. Submit that all the testimony tells you the same consistent accounts, internally, externally, from civilian testimony to investigator testimony, to medical testimony, to forensic testimony, to the reconstruction testimony. You have the testimony from Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts that they couldn't see Mr. O'Keefe in Fairview when they initially pulled up. You can see that from Officer Sarah Struzan. <clears throat> you have Mr. O'Keefe being covered in snow from the storm. You know where Mr. O'Keefe's body was. It's, it's clearly visible on the cruiser camera from Officer Sarah. You have the testimony from each of the responding officers, anywhere from 5 to 12 feet off the roadway, and from the civilians as well. Ms. McCabe, Ms. Roberts, Officer Mullaney has six inches of snow on Mr. O'Keefe when he first sees him. Firefighter Kelly says that he couldn't even see Mr. O'Keefe until he was five feet away in the darkness, in the snow, in the blizzard condition. There's no footprints around the body. There's no drag marks around the body. <clears throat> There's no evidence of anything in relation to Brian Albert and Brian Higgins. Brian Albert and Brian Higgins spent January 28, 2022, traveling to New York City to go to a funeral for another police officer, for another department, who they didn't even know. Traveled all the way down to New York and then came back before the blizzard, only to come back from that to go out drinking, come back to Mr. Albert's house to then murder another police officer who they did know, who worked for the same department as them. And then criminal mastermind genius that Brian Albert is, 28 years on the Boston Police Department, he's then going to just leave Mr. O'Keefe's body on his front lawn? Really? 
That's a conspiracy. What evidence do you have of that? You have statements that the defendant made to Sergeant Buchanan on January 29th. She was willing to speak, but didn't want to give too much detail. Conversational tone throughout. <clears throat> she indicated that the night before they had gotten into an argument, something about uh, what was fed to the children, nothing about the detailed arguments, and incessant phone calls, and everything else that you saw from the defendant and Mr. O'Keefe's phone on the 28th. She indicated that she got to CF McCarthy's around 9 p.m., started drinking vodka sodas, the men were drinking beers. When asked where she parked her vehicle, she said she parked on Washington Street across from CF McCarthy's, facing northbound on the side, uh, same side as Waterman. Same testimony that she heard from Ms. Paula Kipis, observing the defendant going over to her vehicle, getting in the driver's seat, and the, the victim, Mr. O'Keefe, getting into the passenger's seat. She said they were left the waterfall, were invited to her residence. She drove her and John to the location in Canton. She dropped Mr. O'Keefe off, did not see him walk into the home. She, being the defendant, stated she made a three-point turn and then left. When asked about the damage to her vehicle, she indicated to the troopers, I don't know, it happened last night. June 2022, you have that other recording of that other version uh, that she now has evolved into as far as uh, stating to Sergeant Buchanan, are you aware that John was beaten up by Brian and Colin Albert? We're all in on the same joke, right? John was pulverized and my taillight was cracked. What evidence do you have of that? Mr. O'Keefe never went in the house. You have testimony from Nicole Albert, Brian Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, Caitlin Albert, Brian Albert Jr., Sarah Levinson, Julie Nagel, all indicating never went in the house. John O'Keefe's phone never went in the house from the testimony and the data points that you have from Trooper Green. You know how Mr. O'Keefe was dressed and you know the defendant knew that. You have the testimony from Kurt Roberts, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, Karina Kolokitis, Nicholas Kolokitis, Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Brian Higgins, all indicated in the testimony and the defendant knew that based on our questions to the firefighters the next morning that Mr. O'Keefe was not dressed for the weather when he left the waterfall. The weather was a weapon. You have the testimony about the car, the defendant's car being there in front of the house, moving multiple times. You have that from multiple sources. You have that from Matthew McCabe. You have that from Jennifer McCabe. You have that from Brian Albert Jr. You have that from Julie Nagel. You have that from Ryan Nagel. You have the testimony of Ryan Nagel, Ricky D'Antono, and Heather Maxson. Ms. Maxson indicated she saw a male passenger, female operator, as the vehicle was turning. Remember, they're coming towards Fairview at the same time. The defendant, after conducting that reverse, a three-point turn on Cedar Crest, was then taking a right on to Fairview, while Ms. Nagel, Mr. D'Antono, and Ms. Maxson are taking a left on to Fairview. Mr. Nagel indicates that Mr. D'Antono then flashes lights. During that time, Ms. Maxson can see inside the vehicle. She sees a male passenger. She sees a female operator. They follow the vehicle as they're turning onto the street. Lo and behold, they're going to the same residence. They park. There's nothing in between them and the defendant's vehicle. They indicate that at no time do they see anybody get out of the vehicle. At no time do they see any damage to the vehicle, or it hasn't happened yet. At no time do they see anyone leave the vehicle and go into the house. The vehicle moves up on different successive occasions, as testified to by Mr. Nagel and several others. And then as they're passing that vehicle, Mr. Nagel indicates that he sees a female operator in the vehicle with dome light on. And interesting, when I asked Mr. Nagel as far as when Julie Nagel came out to the vehicle, did he roll down the window or did he open the door? He indicated he opened the door. And I asked him, what happens when you open the door? What happens when you open the door to a vehicle? The dome light comes on. So there's reason I would submit, or the inference that you can make, is that no one sees Mr. O'Keefe in the vehicle because that's the moment he steps out of the vehicle. And then they're gone. The Nagels, Ryan Nagel, Ricky D'Antono, <clears throat> and Heather Maxson drive away from that. We have the testimony from Julie Nagel and Sarah Levinson, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich conversation they have with Ms. McKay, which uh, while they're pulling away from the house where everybody's attention is drawn, Ms. McKay has turned around facing both of them in the backseat. Um, Ms. Nagel is facing Ms. Levinson on the passenger side, looking out the window towards uh, 34 Fairview Road. Ms. Levinson is looking back at Ms. Nagel uh, away from that area in which Ms. Nagel indicates that she sees a five to six foot dark blob on the lawn near the pole in the hydrant, which is just where Mr. O'Keefe is discovered the next morning. You have testimony <coughs> recalled and you have text messages uh, in regard to Colin Albert when he gets picked up. Mr. Colin. Lally, five minutes. Yes, sir. Colin Albert, Ms. Uh, Al Allison McKay, Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Caitlin Albert, Brian Jr. Okay. All indicating that we picked up around that time at 12, 10 a.m. You have the testimony from Chris and Julie Albert, his parents as far as when he comes home, kisses him tonight before he goes to bed. <clears throat> you have that testimony in regard to um, Chris Albert as far as how John O'Keefe and the defendant come to be at the waterfall in the first place, as far as John O'Keefe and his nephew coming in early in the day, getting a couple slices of pizza, what he's doing later on, contained within those sections. You have the testimony from Lieutenant O'Hara, Lieutenant Tully, Sergeant Mechanic, about uh, those items being recovered. And in particular, the items being recovered on January 29th by that search team. What did Lieutenant O'Hara say? 
The items were found close to the curb. The items were at ground level, three feet of snow that they had to sift through in order to find those particular things. The detail or the delay in the recovery of evidence. The photos in the video, most of which you have in evidence is earlier in the storm. This is before the 18 inches of snow falls down, before there's drifts and three feet of snow in places. They found the evidence where it had been at that same ground level, in the grass, under the snow, at 34 Fairview Road. You heard all of the medical testimony, uh, which I would submit is consistent, from Firefighter Formati to Dr. Rice. You heard a uh, testimony regarding the defendant's blood alcohol concentration from Dr. Fowler and Nick Roberts, 93 milligrams per deciliter, 0.07 to 0.08 percent at 9.08 in the morning. You heard it, Mr. Roberts' testimony in regard to the retrograde extrapolation, 0.13 to 0.29, um, extrapolating back to the time of the operation. The defendant admits to drinking vodka. It's on the receipts from C.F. McCarthy's and from the waterfall. And you have the witness testimony in the surveillance video in regard to that. <clears throat> The forensic testimony that you have. <clears throat> in regard to the medical testimony, you have the sort of pattern abrasions, the clear plastic that's recovered by Lieutenant O'Hara and Lieutenant Tully on January 29th. The clear plastic that has the dimples on it. No one, not Trooper Paul, not anyone at any point in time ever said Mr. O'Keefe's arm was out like this at the time he was struck and then did a pirouette and then flew 30 feet in the air. 12 inches of... Actually, Trooper Paul did testify to that and he held his arm up when he was demonstrating it. So that's not true. That the doctors were, uh, the, the biomechanical people were talking about yesterday, 12 inches and then six inches to the tail. is easily solved by this. And the dimples on his arm are, that I would submit are consistent with the dimples on the tail legs of these are right around this area of the elbow. You have <clears throat> the testimony in regard to forensics, as far as Mr. Porto, Mr. Bradford, John O'Keefe's DNA is on that tail light house, on the house. His DNA is there to the exclusion uh, as well of Sergeant Mechanic and Trooper Crawford. Mr. O'Keefe's DNA is on the exterior of the broken drinking glass. Mr. O'Keefe's DNA and only Mr. O'Keefe's DNA is on his clothing and his fingernails, consistent with Dr. Sporty Bellow's testimony that there is no evidence of a fight or an altercation. There's no one else's DNA under his fingernails. There's no one else's DNA on his clothing. <clears throat> you have a testimony from Ms. Hartman and Trooper Paul as regards to uh, the damage that they observed, the dents, the scratches, the 7 8 7 inch hair. There's, uh, you have testimony from Ms. Chart in regard to the mitochondrial DNA profile from that hair being consistent uh, with the DNA profile <coughs> of Mr. O'Keefe. You have the testimony from Mick Valier and Ms. Hanley in regards uh, to the microscopic pieces, 1 16th of an inch by 1 16th. You have one minute, Mr. Lally. Wrap it up. Yes, sir. All consistent with pieces of taillights uh, that are found uh, within his clothing. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, if I could. 605, this is what this vehicle looks like backing up at that scene uh, for approximately that distance. There's another <coughs> years and years ago, I started practicing in Norfolk County. Braintree was now Quincy. I eventually became a far smarter man than myself. Eventually became President of the United States. His name was John Adams. John Adams once wrote, facts are stubborn things. And whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of the facts and the evidence. What the constellation of the facts and the evidence ineluctably demonstrate here is that the defendant drove her vehicle in reverse at 24.2 miles per hour for 62 and a half feet, struck Mr. O'Keefe, causing those catastrophic head injuries, leaving him incapacitated and freezing to death. Mr. Lally, I have to stop you. You've gone over. I literally have one sentence. <laughs> one sentence, I'll give you that. From that fact and that evidence, I would submit and electively demonstrates their guilt on each of the indictments before you, and I would ask that you find this. Thank well, there's that. So I expect to have some sort of verdict uh, because I think, because all they're doing is giving jury instructions and then they're going to release the well, jury to deliberate. They should already be in deliberations now, right? Mm -hmm. because they just started. Video... Well, no, they have to give uh, jury instructions. So right now, they're still giving jury instructions. Yeah. Yeah. She's giving it, the judges uh, reading the instructions. So, but that can, the, the minute everybody... Uh, once we're on verdict watch once this is yep that's it all right well 
It is what it is. Now it's in the hands of the jurors and let's see how fast they come back with a decision. I agree. All right. Until then, we'll spoke at you later. All right. Peace. Mm -hmm.